All right, we are all the way live. Welcome everybody to another episode of the BTR stream. I am your humble host, Lev Polyakov, with the great Giovanni Panacchietti, as always. <laughs> the great Charles Kahn is joining us, and of course we have the absolutely great Sean Lang joining us tonight, or today rather. See, I get confused because of the times. But either way, Sean depending is- Depending on where a... you are in the world. Yeah, depending on where yeah, you are. It's, it's nighttime it... somewhere. It is nighttime somewhere. So it is a great pleasure, Sean, to uh, have you with us today. And uh, right. I have over here a uh, book that you uh, that you uh, oh. wrote, <laughs> nice. British History for Dummies. Well, here it is. As I'm they really... say, the sun never set on the British Empire because God did not trust an Englishman in the dark. So <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. So you are the writer of this book, and you are also senior lecturer at Ang a Anglia Ruskin University. I hope I'm saying that correctly. That's right. That's correct. And uh, your specialty is in British history, history of the British Empire. And uh, what would you say was the thing that brought you into this fold? What got you interested in history to begin with? Oh, history to begin with goes back a very long way. I mean, that goes right way back to childhood. Um, difficult to, to pinpoint anything, but I suppose it helps if you grow up as I did with um, historic buildings around you, although that's the case almost wherever you live in this country. Um, so yeah, that, that sort of thing got me interested. Um, you know, there were various books at, 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 at home and at school that got me interested. So yeah, the, the interest goes way back to small childhood. Um, the empire thing, uh, is a little bit more recent and uh, there's a bit more of a story behind it because uh, it's not that empire wasn't taught about or talked about, it, it was, but it wasn't a sort of big thing. It was a sort of on the side as I was growing up, you know, at school and at university. Um, but when I was teaching um, and I decided we, we could create uh, our own study and I decided to look at British India. And part of that unquestionably was because I have a family link there. My family were in India for about three generations and that creates an interest at the back of your head, you know, the back of your mind and you just want to know more. So uh, yeah, it's, it's all sorts of things come together. So when I think of the British Empire, obviously we talked about Sun Never Sets and all that, but I'm also thinking about something that people may have uh, lost along the way. At least that was the impression from that Adam Curtis documentary. So, Gio, I think you saw the entire documentary. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Can't get you out of my head. I don't know, Sean, did you have a chance to see that documentary oh, no, I didn't yet? I see that one. I saw it. it yeah, I saw it was on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Gio, how would you say the impression was of uh, the way that Adam was portraying the British people post World War II, the mentality that they had? And I would be interested in contrasting that with the mentality of the British during the absolute height of the British Empire. I guess that would be a uh, Victorian England. But uh, Gio, uh, take yeah. it away, my friend. Well, that's a good, that's actually a good start to our discussion because um, you know, the thing is with the, the, the recent Adam Curtis documentary is that you have to realize he's coming from like, um, as people have informed me that are in the know, uh, very like normie mainstream, like labor voter type of perspective. But he does, he does bring up a lot of good points as like the vanguard of and, and this is a point that my friend who is also professor uh jeffrey schulenberger he said you know look at the the sort of the the uh the the left wing of like the, the british youth of that like 2010s till now you have adam curtis as a cultural figure you also have mark fisher god rest his soul as a cultural figure but their vision of post empire britain is very different even though they come from like that same like you know capitalist realist type of you know black pill sort of milieu uh adam curtis thought that the end of the british empire sorry rather uh, mark fisher thought the end of the british empire presented a lot of new uh possibilities for creating uh unique cultural output and so forth whereas the picture that adam curtis gives in his recent documentary uh he views the sort of post empire impulse towards like this uniquely type of quiet British xenophobia as almost a coping mechanism as these terminally afraid people who don't have a sense of place in the world that they once did. And the newly landed immigrants that came over to Britain, like they came over to Canada during, I would say like the post-war period till the 1970s and eighties, they found, they discovered that, 
it wasn't so much the case as Adam Curtis said that they were going to the mainland, the home of the British Empire, but rather they were going to a place that was hostile and indifferent and there was a bunch of grifters and people like that uh, rather than this embrace of a uniquely imperial vision of what British culture was. Instead, you have this very like reactive uh, feeling of fear and uncertainty or at least that's what Adam Curtis said and therefore you have like this all leading into Thatcherite Britain in the 80s uh, which was sort of like Britain being ironically colonized by a new form of imperialism with like neoliberal economic policy and so forth and then of course modern Britain you know during during the uh, the, the <laughs> The days of uh, Tony Blair and the war on terror and things of that nature. Mm. So he gives a very dark picture of the consequences of the the sort of the loss of, of uh, the British identity through empire itself. So, so uh, I'm curious, uh, Sean, where would you stand on yeah. that? Your uh, your view of uh, the British mind? Well, yeah, broadly <laughs> British speaking, mind. I, I think that's that's a good analysis. Um, but I think the um, the way in which the debate has now come, so that they, you get a very instinctive reaction even to the very phrase British Empire. Um, ironically, it's not that dissimilar. It's like a sort of mirror image of what debate there was at the height of it. And what I mean is that empire is many, many things. It's, it's a multifaceted concept, but absolutely central to it is image. It is about image. It always was, at the, particularly at the height of it. Sometimes that image building was conscious. I mean, literally, they were very uh, aware. I mean, for example, um, in various parts of the colonial world, um, if you were a white Briton, you were supposed to sort of fall in with the local uh, British community. And if you didn't, um, not only did, were you sort of disapproved of, but in extreme cases, you could be actually removed and sort of shipped back to England because you didn't keep up the image. Um, and that image was punctured in the Second World War. But what I mean is that it's about um, a, an image of the British themselves, of the rest of the world, of a sort of uh, a, a European whiteness, of course, which is also in there. And what we have now is also an image. And it's just as simplistic in its way. I mean, that, in other words, the sort of more critical um, oh. view of it is every bit as simplistic and as reductionist as the imperialists themselves had a, an image of themselves again so it's a it's essentially the whole debate about empire and there was a debate about empire at the height of it which often isn't realized is all about exactly what is this image and what is it saying about us as a people and of course about everyone else but it's primarily a, um, about a british conception of themselves and what their role in the world is and what their place in the role uh, in the world is, and and Joe's quite right um, that when that it, that place that you thought was secure has been removed by the fall of empire, you are left wondering, feeling somehow bereft or disinherited. And uh, I mean, the famous phrase, of course, was Dean Acheson: you know, "Britain has lost an empire and not yet found a role." Um, I'm not sure that the, not finding a role. I mean, that may have been true at the time. I think various roles have been found, but it's still thrashing around and the nost and we now have a new type of image which goes into the mix which is a nostalgic one but it's a strange sort of nostalgia because it's a nostalgia for something that most people except the very oldest generation never really knew well i'm personally nostalgic for uh japanese pop music in the 80s as a lot of people are today on the internet, because they can imagine being in that environment and hearing that popular music around that time and liking it. But uh, in the uh, Can't Get You Out of My Head documentary in part five, the Lordy ones, Adam Curtis talks about this guy. I don't remember his name right now, so Gio, please help me out if you can here. But uh, it's uh, the description over here says, the film tells a story of how from the end of the 19th century, a magic vision of Britain's feudal past was created by artists and writers how folk music and folk dancing was invented to create a kind of saved dream of the nation that could hide the violence and the horrors. The weird thing for me here, though, is when it comes to these folk dances, that guy who was described in the video, he did 
go out into the countryside and he met with the people who lived there. He talked with them and he learned uh, all their various uh, folk dancing and other folk ways. So it's very interesting how Adam Curtis is portraying this thing as being completely fabricated, even though the rudiments of it seems to stem from something completely realistic. And I don't really see what is wrong with that. So uh, I, I don't know, like what would be your response to that, Sean? Is this Cecil Sharp that you're talking about? Oh, the, yes, I think it is Cecil Sharp. Yeah, I, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the idea of the invention of tradition is a well-established um, historical idea, and it's absolutely true. And I have to say, with great national pride, you understand that we're very good at it over here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I think um, nearly every big royal ceremony that you can think of, whether it's Troop in the Colour or Prince Diana's funeral or whatever, is essentially an invented tradition. And, uh, and I think, you know, we, uh, no one quite beats us, you know, for making something new look as if it's very old uh, in buildings, in ceremonies, in ritual and so on. Um, and as for a sort of manufactured medieval or pre-medieval past with a very, very rosy um, tint of it and therefore suggesting that is where your roots really lie. Um, I think it's a, perhaps a bit harsh on Cecil Sharp, but he was certainly part of a, of a general move um, or a general trend, I suppose, to find Merry England. That was the phrase that was often used. So it's these pageants that were very, very popular and become increasingly popular early 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century. People getting up in medieval costumes, um, rediscovering aspects of their local history or their national history and identifying yourself as um, it, it, yeah, it's either medieval or, as I say, you can go back to the sort of pre-medieval days of the Anglo-Saxons or even the ancient Britons. Now, to be fair, it's not, this is not peculiar to the British. Um, a similar sort of thing is happening uh, in Ireland with uh, the Irish nationalist movement very much cultivating, uh, again, a very uh, sanitised version of, of Irish culture and, and history. You get the same in India, again, within the Indian nationalist movement, particularly the Hindu um, community, again, sort of building up and indeed creating a sort of ancient tradition, um, the Ganpati festival uh, as part of that. So it's not peculiar to the British. It is something which I think mm. uh, an industrial society needed to do to find its pre-industrial identity. And uh, Germany had the Volkisch movements as well. Absolutely. And I could see, yeah, I could see a lot of these things as being a response to... Pan-Volkism, like, yeah. which people accuse Young of being a part of. <laughs> and uh, we, also have book, a, but, you know. we, we also have Disco Orpheus here. Welcome, Disco. And Disco, you Who is live another in, British uh, yes, exactly. stock original stock <laughs> and uh and, and before before i proceed further uh kyle was asking are y'all doing two streams today yes we are so for we those who do NFT not know yes for those who do not know what's crack lacking this entire week we are having marathon streams today and on thursday so this week we are having the great sean lang talking with him and then uh, we are going to have the nft stream around six o'clock and next week we are going to have the uh, stream about uh we're gonna have gr grit cult coming in and that's going to be at uh, two and then after grit cult we are going to have a very special stream with uh how do you pr ayala ayala i can't ayala say the girl ayala girl yeah uh, oh, is that the first time we're announcing this love yes it is oh boy <laughs> yes it is here we go so yeah. anyway uh disco i would love to uh, hear your thoughts on uh coming up in um uh living in uh, and, england and, and whether you to, oh well, and also whether Oh, go ahead, Bob. Sorry, well, well, just to where, whether you resonate with what Sean was talking about as far as all these different folk traditions, how much have these folk traditions, let's say even before the Industrial Revolution, how much have they been a very important factor in the lives of uh, British people and how much of it post-Industrial Revolution uh, uh, was manufactured in a way to keep people within a certain... Uh, Britishness or a certain uh, nostalgia factor. Great. Can you hear me? Yes, mm -hmm. I can. Okay. Sorry. I'm just driving. So um, uh, <laughs> someone has speakers. So as long as you can hear me, that's great. Thanks, Lev. Um, so I guess growing up, uh, so I grew up in the countryside. Um, the traditions that I seem to remember when I was a kid, Morris dancing, mm, um, the, the maypole, uh, the the hunt, the Boxing Day hunt. Uh, but in terms of sort of folk tradition, it, there wasn't an awful lot 
I think in the 90s, things have dissipated, at least in my experience. Um, I, I grew up in the southeast, uh, so my personal experience isn't full uh, to the brim of, of uh, folk tradition, I suppose. Well, what I'm interested in finding out is not even folk tradition itself, but what exactly are people today, like younger people in uh, Britain, what are they resonating with of when it comes to what does it mean to be British? Because there was that, I remember, you know, was it back in the day, Lauren Southern, she was uh, uh, going through uh, England and asking people, like, what does it mean to be British? And, you know, some people would say, oh, you have a British passport. It's like, but uh, more than that, it seems like the empire, for all the bad things that it uh, ended up doing in its wake, did at least have a certain quality, like Sean said, that it wanted people to uh, to live up to. And uh, before we get back to Sean, I was wondering, Disco, if there is any way that you can mm, dissect what exactly that quality is and uh, go sure. for it. Sure. Um, so I would say most young people my age don't have a very good conception of what it means to be British or English. Uh, it sort of revolves around the Six Nations. Um, so this is rugby. Uh, and that involves England, France, Ireland, Wales, Italy uh, and Scotland. Um, but in terms of their identity, a lot of things are broken down into these cliches like fish and chips and cups of tea and Yorkshire puddings. Um, you know, and it's really, yeah, it's sort of anathema. Nobody really, nobody really cares these days is what, is what I would say. Um, a small percentage do, of course, I do. Um, but if you were to go out into the street and ask or bring beer, being British means. Um, it's just being part of Europe, I suppose, and having a sordid history that everyone wants to apologize for, um, as well as, uh, yeah, council houses, violence, <laughs> beers. It's just become, it's become a, yeah, a cliche and a parody, yeah. which is a shame. Well, this really now changed even, like, if you look at, like, cultural output, like, like uh, what was that one show in the 90s with... Well, actually, it stayed till the early 2000s with, uh, with uh, Helen Mirren. Little... Uh, Prime Suspect, there you go. And you see, like, the decay in the townhouses and the, the council houses. And it's just, to me, I, I guess, I don't know, It's it seems that um, that sort of Anglo-cosmopolitanism finally uh, opened up uh, in, in some ways... Uh, more than a lot of other European uh, powers. It seems that Britain, for some reason, has decided to follow in the footsteps of this, like, Americanization of culture. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't know. I think, I think, so I lived in America for five years um, between the ages of 18 and 23. And I loved my time there, but when I came back, I was sort of escaping this cosmopolitan sort of... Um, superficial imposition it's corporate culture and it came back to england and realized england was just three or four years behind america and it's and it's <laughs> being swept up by the same superficiality i suppose um and you know we had tv shows like little britain that was really big when i was a kid um i don't know if you've heard of that uh, oh i think but, i have yeah last of the yeah. summer wine <laughs> you know? it was with uh, david walliams and matt lucas who are these two comedians um and that little Britain was the mentality, this sort of, or rather it wasn't the mentality, that's what they were trying to portray. Uh, the grug-brained um, rural farmer, son of a farmer who didn't really know left from right. And I, I think that one of the biggest problems that caused this was the way we were taught history in school. Um, it was done in a non-linear fashion. It went from, you know, kings and queens, Tudors, and then, and then you would maybe you touched on the Boer War and the Crimean War, and then you were thrown into World War Two, and then after World War Two you learn about World War One, uh, and so people, kids couldn't really put cause and effect um, into their own history and understand where we've come from, uh, and I think that a lot of that was the, was down to this sort of Blairite 
introduction of Common Core and how the education system changed. I don't know an awful oh, lot. Oh, you had that's, Common Core, like sort of, Tony Blair. That's that's how much he was willing it's, it's, to. It's uh, not good. Impress yeah, his buddy cool George talk. W. Bush. <laughs> yeah, Common Core. <laughs> well, well, uh, so it, Sean, wasn't, it wasn't called Common Core. It had a different name, but we had mm. a oh, similar sort of similar sort of incentive um, target based educational system that was introduced. Well, speaking of the educational system, I mean, Sean, you are in the educational system. Yeah, I so, mean, but that but that type of American like standardized test type of focus that's like totally alien to the British education system. Yeah, well, like, Sean, would you agree, yeah. Sean? Yeah, the um, the education system is a bit, it's a bit complex, but there was no national uh, system um, until the late eighties, uh, apart from exams. You know, where, where but and even then, there still is a lot of choice. There's no single sort of set of exams you you can choose between different providers of, of exams. There's, it's a remarkable sort of free market, um, and then a national curriculum was brought in um, by the Conservative government um, but under under Mrs Thatcher. Um, and although in theory the idea was that that would lay down everything that every child would would learn in, in what is actually though i'm not sure mrs thatcher would have liked to hear it a very french idea you know this idea of a heavily centralized mm -hmm. curriculum but it never actually um took form you know it, it never it always fell far far short of of what they intended um partly because of the way they did it which was very piecemeal and partly also because in the practicalities um and there weren't the sort of standard tests that's the big difference um i wrote uh, confusingly there were things called sats but they're not the same as the american sats it's a very different thing and uh, so the testing regime ne uh, never really took hold and then just to add to it the same well to be fair it started with tony blair and then the conservatives picked it up the idea of allowing schools to opt out of the state system while remaining state funded meant that the national curriculum basically now doesn't exist um, well, in primary schools it does, but it doesn't really exist in secondary schools except as a sort of set of guidelines which you may follow or may not. So it never, although the desire was there, in practice, the sort of very, very um, varied uh, sort of provision that actual teachers in the classroom gave continued. But the press always treated it, and it, not just the press, but many other people, always treated it as, as if there was one curriculum. So you'd have a particular group, very often with very good motives, who would say this ought to be in the national curriculum, or this is really important, why aren't children taught this? This ought to be there. And you'd have ministers, in, uh, indeed, who would say, you know, this will need to be in the national curriculum. But because the subject wasn't compulsory, um, beyond 14. It didn't really matter what you put in the national curriculum uh, for the most part because relatively few children would actually do it and, he, and they would only do it if their teachers chose to do it. So in fact we have a um, yeah a sort of free market um, and all the attempts to try to regulate that they've had some success but it's only it's only ever been limited um so you know when you uh, and and the sort of thing that uh, the disco was describing i certainly recognize because um not least because i was teaching the sort that sort of thing and that was um, again it was very good reasons for it they wanted to get away from an old-fashioned plod through one king or battle after another king or battle or whatever um but the result was that for you know, for very good reasons, but in terms of the content, it did end up very, very eclectic. A bit of this, a bit of that, and so on. And he's what, what Disco describes is 100% right. You could learn about something without really understanding where it came from, where it fitted into a wider pattern, what the causation, still less the consequences, might have been. Very desiccated type of, uh, yeah. uh, of impact. Wow. And I think it's left, left a lot of people with... In fact, the book uh, you held up there, <laughs> Lev, um, uh, people, when people... Um, uh, complimented me and said oh, what they said was for the first time we can see where the bits of knowledge that we learned at school fit in to a, to a wider picture so, and, mm. and and that's why I was very glad to write it oh wow but that it's funny I remember this Alan Watts lecture where he talks about the British education system and in the university system where uh, it was very almost informal, which is kind of a shocker for like North American people where you could mill about, you wrote like tons of essays. They would actually weigh the S like weigh the essays one day. Um, but you could mill about, you could sort of, it was all about trying to like connect and make impersonal relations with um, an impersonal relationship with almost like a mentor or like yeah. a young boy system of like an, a very old, like ancient professor ahead of a, the head of the department of philosophy and you would mill about and it's like, you could go to the lectures you, or you couldn't. It's, it's a very much your own sort of uh, finding yourself 
rather than like in in the North American. I hate to say it, even Canada is somewhat like this, although we're a bit better than America because of our British influence or Anglo Canada, where you have to like go through a specialization. You have to find this person and go through this particular channel. But uh, nowadays, I uh, yeah, I, I feel that the education system itself, but um, another thing too, which is fascinating, um, you said that your family, I guess, I don't know if it's a dirty word now, but you, your family was a part of the British Raj. Uh, yeah. Wow. And I, I wonder, do, do you feel that there is somewhat still of that special connection with um, the relation between the, the British and sort of the uh, India proper but also in the sense of having such an illustrious and very fraught and uh, at, at some points, um, you know, <laughs> very uh, interesting history, to put it lightly, in, in the sort of Indian subcontinent. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you feel that it, out of all of the sort of colonial experiences, people, when they think of British colonialism, they think of the Raj. And, and do you feel that in Britain with such a large um, population of people from India who've literally been there multiple generations now, uh, do you feel that that in some ways is part almost fundamental of the modern British identity? Because it seems that a lot of the, the sort of tensions over what is the quote unquote British identity nowadays, it seems that the Raj was a fundamentally transformative experience. I mean, you've been there for so long since the 1800s, right mm -hmm. up until, you know, practically World War II, right? So, but as uh -oh. someone who has had family that had, you know, yeah. been there, like that's, to me, that's fascinating. And also, also, also Buff ahead, asks, Buff asks, uh, Runyard Kipling, based or cringe? <laughs> I say based. Based. <laughs> yeah. Well, it depends. Based. The Jungle like Book is based. I make a lot of use of Kipling. He's a very, he's much, he's a much more nuanced writer than um, people tend to uh, give him, tend to think. And very often, the people who tend to think that haven't read that much of him. Um, there's a couple of poems which they also tend not to, not not quite to grasp. I've always found this with literature people. They never, they've never read any, but they say no, we don't want to read them. Uh, so it tends to be historians who, who read Kipling and have a bit more of an understanding of uh, where he fits in. But uh, to, uh, to answer Gio's point, I would say, I haven't sort of thought of it this way, but I think this is right. We always talk about the special relationship between Britain and the States. I think it makes more sense to talk of a special relationship between Britain and India um, because there's a substantial British Asian population with uh, often very strong uh, Indian roots. Um, I mean, from various parts of India, obviously there's a Muslim population from particular areas of Pakistan. There's a, an Indian population from all over the subcontinent. We're on to the you know, good second, maybe third generation now and it makes for a very complex, multi-layered relationship. Um, there's much more, if you look in popular culture, it's much more common than it used to be to see uh, you know, a, a, a multi-ethnic uh, cast uh, and without their multi-ethnicity being part of the drama at all. There's a, you know, it, it's, it's a reflection of, of modern Britain. Um, there's a discovery process, uh, what are we, 2021, in uh, 2017, to mark the anniversary of partition and independence for India and Pakistan. Um, there are a number of programs and, and this time round, obviously 10 years earlier, there'd been programs as well, but this time round, um, it was noticeable that a lot of British Asians were discovering the lived experience of their grandparents back in 1947 for the first time. And, uh, and of course, if they were discovering it for the first time, you know, the white Britons were also in many cases discovering it for the first time. So I think, the relationship is a uh, is a close one. It's not straightforward. There's also, of course, has, has developed um, a sort of alternative one between uh, India and the states. With you know, um, you see it, for example, in university choices. Until I don't know about ten, maybe twenty years ago, it was absolutely normal for Indians if they were going to go outside India to look at British universities, increasingly uh, American universities. Um, so it's a, a, there's an alternative route there. So it's not straightforward. But certainly my own experience is that um, instead of, sort of getting all terribly worried and apologetic about the past, it makes much more sense to see this as a, as a past that was shared um, and, uh, you know, which provides a sort of common grounding. So there's a, even to the point, and I know this sounds small and trivial, but 
I always say to my students, small things matter far more than big things do. The fact that um, some years ago, Chicken Tikka Masala was, no, was nominated as the typical British dish, not fish and chips, not bacon and egg, but an Indian dish, admit it, and an Indian dish created in England. The reason it's, it's red is because the, the chef sort of put some tomato soup, a tin of tomato soup in and mixed it in. So there's a story behind it. Um, but yeah, the, you know, the, the eating habits are important. They reflect a, a deeper cultural um, identity, I suppose. So I would say there's much more of a, an intertwining of British and Indian now than there is really between British and American, except, except in the sense of, uh, of visual, audiovisual culture. Um, and yeah, a special relationship. I mean, I mentioned my family. Yeah, we were there in, um, as I say, in various parts of India and at least three generations, um, right up to my father's uh, time. So, you know, it's quite quite recent in terms of the family. Um, and I always tell this story because my, my grandfather died because he would not be touched by an Indian doctor. He had gallstones, refused to let an Indian doctor treat him, had to be carried 100, uh, 100 miles. And uh, and by the time he got to the European hospital, this is in 1930, um, you know, he, he died. Now, I, was, I think that's quite a telling story because it shows, um, you know, it's, it's an awful thing. Had it happened a few years earlier, I wouldn't be here. Um, but it also, you know, it shows the change in, in attitudes and the, in the end, the, uh, the, the self-destructive nature of that sort of arrogance of that sort of uh, of exclusivity. It's quite a sobering tale, I was, I was fine. Yeah. Well, since you're mentioning uh, India right now, in uh, the various tantras, there is this idea of uh, balancing the various uh, gunas. So gunas are qualities you would have, you know, you were using the term British Raj, you would have Rajas, which is supposed to be this royal, solar, uh, very powerful quality. Then you have Tamas, which is supposed to be the opposite, you know, sleepy or destructive. And then you have uh, sattvas, which is supposed to be the quality of transcending and not really going out, but instead going within and finding the one thing that connects you and everybody else to the, you know, uh, Brahma, whatever you want to call it, the source of everything. So what's interesting for me as far as balancing these three gunas within your body is balancing, on one hand, this quality of, you know, not being so incredibly xenophobic that you would refuse uh, surgery from an Indian yeah. doctor, while on the other hand, looking at the bigger picture of uh, what we were touching on a bit earlier, where people who live in uh, England, uh, Britain in general, that there's not really that same idea of like, what does it mean to be British? And on one hand, you could say, well, that's good, multiculturalism, there's room for new ideas. But on the other hand, if there isn't something that creates a feeling, you know, that you are within other people who share your same uh, belief systems, who share the same worldview, uh, that there isn't the sense of you being part of a uh, extended family, if you will, mm -hmm. then what are the eventual downsides of that? My fear is that the eventual downsides have already taken shape in one form or another in terms of conflict, in terms of people not feeling that, uh, you know, that good living amongst people that they don't feel like they can trust. And there have been certain instances in, in England uh, which were the results of culture clashes. So that makes me, uh, you know, concern for both sides here if both sides aren't feeling that uh, feeling that you could say may have been somewhat implanted by these folk songs that were paraded around back in the day but at the same time there may be something to it or at least people who are referencing it today are talking about it as something that they once had and that's since been lost so I'm curious uh, what you think of that and then I would love to also hear from Remus who is uh, joining us as well I think it has to be based, any relationship um, which has got these roots in history needs to be based on uh, a certain level of knowledge to start with. Otherwise, it's, of course, the alternative is that it's based on ignorance and ignorance means that you build up um, a picture uh, of usually a highly inaccurate picture of the other. Indeed, you start othering with a, with a capital O. Um, and I th I, this is where I think the point that Disco was making earlier about the nature of, of uh, history education is so important. And, and I was saying you know, when the, in 2017 um, families were discovering for the first time the, the real story or the, you know, the full story of what happened in 1947. And that sort of um, lack of knowledge means that you do get the, I mean, if, if it's not going to come from 
uh, schools, if it's not going to come from you know, academics, where's it going to come from? Because people do pick up a version of the past um, and it will come from much less reputable uh, sources. And so they pick up the very malign, they pick up the very um, uh, hostile, simplistic images of, of the other. And this, this can be done on both sides. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, creating a sense of Britishness out of a, uh, a very disparate type of, uh, of you know, post-war population, I suppose there's a comparison with the States at the time, you know, in the, the early 20th century, the sort of melting pot um, um, challenge, except we haven't really done it in quite the same way, because instead of sort of saying everyone is British, it's, it's more that people have developed their own sense of Britishness. So there are different types of, of uh, British Britishness, there's sort of British Asian, there's sort of Black British, um, uh, is it Irish British and so on. And you see this, we've, we've, I mentioned we, we've just been doing the census, we did it on, on Sunday. And uh, that's where you had to tick a box actually to say, you know, that sometimes you do have to do that. Um, and I suppose the key lies in, if you put the Asian, the, the black, the white, the Irish, the white British, whatever, to one side and then say, what is the British bit that, that is in every name? And where does that um, identity lie? It will lie in a shared experience, which will tend to be in the cultural area. So I'm talking about I'm talking about television. I'm talking about popular culture. I'm talking about monarchy. Um, that plays a role there as well. Um, and to some extent um, in party politics, but only to some extent, I think. Um, I forget who it was mentioned, the Europe issue, because, of course, uh, that was the burning issue um, until a couple of years ago. And it's sort of died down a little bit in, in the last year or so. But um, I think the other factor to build in here is the generational one, because there are significant differences which came out in the Brexit vote which broadly speaking went along generational lines, um, generational stroke educational lines. Um, and the sort of sense of uh, embarrassment and apology for national identity that Disco was mentioning, which I think is absolutely there, but it tends to be in the so typically in the educated um, younger uh, you know, area go to the less highly educated or go to the older generation and there's much more of an assertiveness much more of a sort of bullishness if you like um and i think it's that's that sort of it, a failure to recognize that which caught people out when it came to the uh the election um in 2019 and of course the brexit vote in 2016. so there's much more variety of approaches to the whole question of of identity then um then i think you know um well we need to be aware of it at any rate you know um and and it can often cut, catch you out i would be yeah, very i think sean is oh, uh, Sean's yes. referring to the dichotomy of um the Islet islington liberal elite and then the bull <laughs> on one side and then the bulldog nationalism on the other side yeah no, so absolutely cambridge elites will do as well yeah sure yeah yeah yeah, I mean, I, I saw beautifully encapsulated once in ten years ago, uh, as the uh, royal wedding of uh, William and, K and Kate was approaching. And I heard this conversation, um, but in a local in a cafe, and he was a guy I, I would guess was a sort of postgrad student. He was talking to a couple of foreign visitors, and he was saying how absolutely no one in in Britain was interested in the royal wedding. Uh, it was purely for tourism, purely for show, mm. uh, and no one was really interested. And that was in Cambridge, right? I was then uh, going up north um, to visit family and uh, and you got out of Cambridge and I can I, there were shops full of big displays all about the royal wedding um huge I was really quite surprised myself because I hadn't expected quite so much and I thought now that's what I mean you get into these sort of yeah Islington Oxbridge Westminster bubbles and you think that's the story and it isn't there's a whole world out there and too many people inside the bubble don't know about it there's the uh the north of uh, no, uh north fc oh, and God. this is north tech so I, th I think we went over this a while ago but people this do is have british these... futurism right this yes is what, exactly this is what mark fisher <laughs> talked about this is the hauntology of british futurism <laughs> people have these ways that i see uh, as being uh, you know even though they're crudely drawn i see a bit of admiration uh in uh, these uh north englanders uh being portrayed here of the well, it's north funny englanders. because they're like 4chan that like made the north fc meme it's like a way of making fun of like the sort of 
I don't know, deracinated little Englander and they're all like these, you know, hideous figure, blo- bloviated <laughs> figures. But at the same time, there is like a reverence for like the unabashed British pride of the average little England here and it's always about like uh you know we don't tolerate no nonsies here and all that stuff so yeah i've seen great <laughs> photos that are that are three gentlemen walking down the street that look exactly like the cartoon characters it is a wonderful, wonderful <laughs> yeah. thing. this is also an image i really like and deshaun can you please explain what is going on here what are these uh that, that's the romans being uh trolled by ah, the Gaelic, right. uh Jim. Yeah, this is the, well, not having seen the picture, but yeah, this is a Roman, and the guys in blue would be, uh, I'm assuming, would the, Picts. Be the, the, the Britons, because they did paint themselves blue. Um, oh, and Dis- Disco said the Picts specifically. Yeah, right? that, that was, yeah, um, Picts are the, <laughs> in, 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 in what, is, what later became Scotland. Um, yeah. Picts means painted people. But yeah, the, right. the, the Britons in, in other parts of Britain painted themselves with blue colors as well and they yeah they're basically uh ganging up they're, they're trolling the roman <laughs> <laughs> and, and what are those pipes that they're using were these traditional well, that, the trumpet and they did have those i mean you get it in gaul as well very very sort of tall things um often in a in a sort of animal's mouth up at the top um yeah that is i'm impressed with the archaeological accuracy of the of the drawing there here is a uh, here is one more. What I like about this one is that uh, the oh uh, he he can't even go to sleep at night. <laughs> oh. Poor Roman. Yeah, yes, it's, uh, early uh, early Twitter trolling. Yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. Pro, so proto Twitter trolling. So I want I want to get to Remus and touch back on uh, what we were talking before in relation to well, this feeling I mean, of. I get. I guess we have to. I mean, I guess we I have to now Mark. talk about Meghan Markle and. Uh, oh well, I, we'll, I had this we'll get to Meghan Markle, okay, well, but, but I also want to make sure. But I also want to make sure the disco. I don't know how long you have because you said that you have only an hour. Because I want to make sure we get to the ley lines too. Because I read a bit uh, about the ley lines in uh, in your book, so I want to get to that oh. a bit. Uh, but let me know if you have to go. Then we'll we'll get to it sooner than later. But, I can go uh, until I can go until half eight, so um, another okay. f- f- forty-five minutes. Okay, cool. All right, so Remus, go for it, buddy. I'm curious what you think of. Uh, I mean, as a uh, well, are you living in Canada right now or in America? Yeah, no, I'm in the states right now. Cool. So, as a uh, American, but I was looking... I was raised well, in the uh, in the colonies. Yeah, I was raised in the colonies. So, uh, <laughs> hello, uh, hello, uh, big, big brother. <laughs> Uh, uh, well, well, hello, hello Glenn. Yeah, no. <laughs> Should we give him the test and make him say sorry? Um, <laughs> make him say I, sorry, I wanna... make him say about. Yeah, right. um, I, I did want to just ask for a little bit of context because I'm, I'm just a little, like I heard the, the, the end of that, but I wasn't, I wasn't sure what, um, what sure once i came so, in what what you were speaking of what so the uh, of what you were speaking was, yeah. so the main thing that i'm interested in uh finding people uh, people's opinion on is when it comes to certain disconnects which from what i assume may be happening right now in uh england as i'd say they're also happening in uh, america when it comes to multiculturalism when it comes to people who come from uh, different cultures what does it mean to be british same with like what does it mean to be american but i think british even more so it's a much smaller place there's not as much room to uh go around and start your own things there are traditions that were there so what do you see as being potential as an outsider kind of looking in but also as somebody from the colonies what do you see as some potential downsides down the road uh if uh people don't have something more than food and footy and things of that nature to share as far as what makes a uh, common culture. Love me kebabs, like more than that, right? Yes, more um, than that. Yeah, okay, <laughs> well, first of all, I think those memes are actually really, really effective uh, in a weird way. They're kind of like uh, cultural totems, like people are creating a, uh, a a weird version of Paul Bunyan, you know what I mean? That That's theirs. That, they. It, it's it's made in mockery at first, but then people own it. Like they don't care. Like they're like, yeah, I am that guy. You know what I mean? And and uh, you know, even even outside of England, there's a kind of there's mentalities about England. There's sort of like Hobbit England. There's there's uh, there's Oxford England. There's Cockney England. It's just like you know, like Sweeney Todd. Like people. People imagine these things about England, even though they may not necessarily be true, but that's the 
the archetypes that live outside and then like you know weird fishing village england and like and then whatever it is that irish people yeah. and scottish people do you know like that that's that's what the outside of 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 the continent is right and and uh, or not the continent rather the island but uh, I, I think not having at least some sort of national image of what it means to be British is like not necessarily I think obviously there's always existed uh, different ways of being British right? I think that's, that's never that's never not been the case right the, the different regions obviously it's 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 a big enough place that you can't all be one way um, and even just the difference between cosmopolitan versus rural, uh, you know, a lot of that stuff, a, lo a lot of the understanding of the difference between those things came kind of from the British sort of, you know, writers and things like that, you know, uh, expanding on these ideas. Um, but, um, yeah, I, uh, just, just to jump on that. You know, yeah, go, go for it. Go for it. Yeah. I think that before the sort of ethnic, um, divisions of what it is to be British, there was, uh, class divisions, obviously, um, and it, you you would see that as a child in your personal life, um, it would, could be demonstrated by who plays rugby and then who plays football. Yeah. Um, so uh, the my, uh, private schools would tend not to play football. So you, if you went to a private school, you wouldn't be able to play football, um, and vice versa. If you went to a, um, a state school or a grammar school, they did they didn't have rugby teams. Um, and that also coincides with a kind of urban rural divide as well, although a little bit less so because there's a lot of urban private schools that play rugby. And then the north south divide is quite a, although it doesn't really, because when everyone moves to London, for instance, or they move to Manchester, um, a lot of people from the south will move up to Manchester, a lot of people from the north obviously will move to London. Um, but where was I going with that? Uh, but it, it, the, the divide is kind of, it's like anywhere north of Dartford is the north. And Dartford is like below London. So that's how people in the southeast would sort of joke about the north, essentially. Um, and then in Scotland, that's beyond the wall. So nobody really knows what those people do anyway. Um, and then there's the West Country, which nobody really understands because they speak a different language, practically. Um, so... That's just the way we joke about it. Uh, but they aren't real divides. Um, exactly. Think, you guys all still know you're British. Like, that's what, I'm, that's what I mean. Right? It's this, this idea. It's exactly this. Go, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You no, know, exactly. We come together when we play international sports. And then we're all one nation. But there is... Ruralism, I feel, used to be stronger than it is now. Uh, when they started building obviously ruralism was everything before uh the industrial revolution and the invention of the steam train um but you know you go to countryside villages now and if you don't have a car you can't really leave um i mean you can get a bus but you'd wait to every two hours or something like that and that kind of ruralism still still exists but uh the dialects have basically died out um i don't know i don't know uh, what's it called um PR, uh, no, RP, received RP. pronunciation. Yeah. yeah. So it's sort of how the newsman talks. Yeah. Um, I suppose that's also how I talk. But uh, yeah, ruralism, ruralism has dissipated over, over time. And do you think uh, Britain is going to get more American as the decades uh, go by? Or will it uh, still remain something of its own thing? Do you think, because Geo always says that American Americanism is taking over. And, uh, yeah, America's biggest export is their culture. Well, I mean, look at the recent. Yeah. Uh, look, look at the recent. Uh, I don't know why we're talking about this. My God, uh, it's but, the World Wide Wrestling Federation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, the recent debacle with uh, the with the Mer I guess Merkel is he's not a part of the family anymore. I, I think. Um, yeah, is he disowned? Is he dis I think so. Yeah, they they or some some weird. I mean, 
Professor I, Lang could probably explain to us how this works, but essentially the fact to me, I had tweeted about like the Hollywoodization of the world is like sort of cemented now because you have like Oprah is like the one delivering the hot goss, as they say, on the, 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 you know, the evils of racism and xenophobia within the British Royal family. And it seems that the Royal family itself has now officially more than at any other period been lowered to the level of like another kind of like Hollywood celebrity. <laughs> like, like you, te- you talk about the Royals the way you talk about, like, I don't know, Brangelina or whoever. Mm. I'd put them up there with yeah, the Kardashians. I mean, yeah, I, the I Kardashians. Like there the Brits, you go. <laughs> I feel like the English have been doing the British, the Brits have been doing this themselves for a lot longer than everybody else has, to be honest. <laughs> well, you to, know to, I mean? Like, yeah. Well, Sh- Sean, well, what do you think? I mean, you mentioned the North, uh, yeah. North FC being much kinder towards the uh, Royals as uh, some uh, other uh, places in the uh, in uh, Britain. Well, I, I, I think what Remus, Remus was just saying, um, yeah, this has been going on a long time. And you were talking about the Americanization. People have been complaining about Americanization and, and growing American influence since uh, at least the 1920s uh, and actually earlier than that. And uh, I suppose a really good example would be an American import, which might surprise you that it is an American import, which would be the crossword. And Mm. the crossword is so associated with the times and it's such a sort of very, very uh, British thing. You know, the Times Mm. crossword, Inspector Morse does does crosswords, you know. And it often comes as a surprise to to learn that it was originally an American import that in in, I think about the 1920s, um, around about then. And it's sort of turned, it's sort of taken in and and sort of repackaged in what appears to be a quintessentially British way. And this is something which has been going on for years. The British have, have a long record of taking an import and repackaging it and, and, and adopting it and indeed presenting it back to the world as, as a sort of uh, authentically British thing. Um, and you know you you can look at uh, you can look at food you can look at uh, you can look at literature you can look at film um, there's you know there's a long there's nothing new about this and the sort of idea that um, Britain will follow uh, America you know a few years you know ten years later or whatever again is and I can even think of a cartoon making exactly the same point and from my childhood which would put it in the sixties or seventies you know there's nothing new about this and it's inevitable because. Um, Partly because of the sort of political relationship and the lang- you know, the shared language and what have you, but above all because of the, the um, as someone was saying, you know, the cultural exports. Although, of course, cultural exports are also a big British. Um, in fact, mm. it's even been said. Uh, Dominic Sandbrook made a program over here a few years ago, suggesting that um, British culture, particularly popular culture, um, is almost like a new British Empire. That it's it's the it's the latest way of spreading British influence um, around the world and sort of boxing way above our weight, um, as it were. And I think you know that, that he made it, he made a good case. So yeah, there's absolutely nothing new about this idea that your identity might be I don't know being diluted or lost or something. I mean, if you think we have it, look at the French um, when they really are worried about creeping Anglicisation of the language, uh, Coca-Cola culture, or, um, whatever the phrase is. You know, um, I mean, they're the ones who really reacted against it because they have such strict law about their language uh, oh look at it in quebec over here exactly. <laughs> I mean, yeah. la. that's like uh, the yeah. like they're like the uh more even more so schizophrenic case of uh like what the french and in, in france are experiencing yeah. but no i mean it's it is interesting because there has been a lot of diffusion the other way i mean it's really for example in Br- the british music scene it's really crazy how people that don't um have grown up with history of sort of unique folk cultures like for example british blues musicians i mean how come how can they do the blues sometimes even better than american (laughs) musicians like the i mean Mm. you do have a lot of the other way going where they the the british the anglo has unique ability to absorb and then synthesize different cultures at once so that could be Uh, you know something but uh but this is what worries me about mm. this concept of cultural appropriation being uh being a bad Mm. thing because this is how culture grows. You do take things, you do borrow things, you do repackage them. That's and it happens everywhere, and 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 so it should. Um, and that's what makes uh, culture international. I don't mean it's uniform around the world, because I think each 
if there is such a thing as a national culture, but let, you know, let's, call, let's go with the idea for the moment. Um, they, they do give it their own particular distinctive spin or shape or flavor or whatever. But I think it's, it's right that you should um, learn, pick up, uh, borrow, appropriate, um, uh, you know, because you're not, you're not denying it to to others. In fact, far from it. So they say, um, "What's it? Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery." Mm. Yeah, and it I should be. It should be seen as an honor. I think yeah, more absolutely. than more than a detriment. And it really worries me that um, the way the current debate in that area is going, we're going to end up, you know, um, where you can only keep to your own very narrow cultural um, corridor, as it were, uh, in, in all, all sorts of areas of cultural life. And I don't see that as a very attractive future at all. We have a comment from Conscious Moss. She is an American and she writes, we have no culture except McDonald's. So, well, in a, I mean, in modern times, she says, but uh, what's interesting for me here is when it comes to this idea of cultural, cultural appropriation, I don't even think it's a matter of, as uh, some people may think, my personal opinion, I don't think it's a matter of sitting down trying to explain why this, uh, you know, why this is a good thing, why culture should learn from each other. Because I think that the people who make that argument about cultural appropriation being bad, that they're already in the battle, they've already taken sides, their only goal is to win the battle and that's it. They don't care about any logic or reason when it comes to this. I see it as being, you know, just purely this vengeful Kali energy that's uh, taken people and they want to get rid of anything, you know, a anything you know, like statues, you know, we were having a conversation yeah, about statues before, but yeah. I think it's ironic that, and this is, this is an assumption, obviously, but um, an Indian in India would probably feel less perturbed by um, the cultural appropriation of, of, of their Indianness than an Indian in Britain would. Um, it's usually, usually the diaspora who are sort of more up in arms, and maybe that's because they're living in a country that they inherently know is not their own. I'm using sort of uh, inverted commas there. But that's also an interesting thing that a country is not their own. What I've been very interested in, and this is sort of where the ley lines are going to play a role in this conversation, but what I'm very interested in finding out here is when it comes to, I'd say, even the Indians who are from India and the British and a lot of the other people, whether there is a uh, perennial truth, as it were, that people have uh, access to, wherein a lot of these cultures that keep on reappearing, this may actually be something that's uh, shared. For example, the South Americans, when they thought that uh, uh, the conquering conquistadors who came in, that they were the mm. quote-unquote gods, yeah. yeah, that they were returning. And if... This is how they uh, how they uh, talked about it. If this is if this is how it happened, then you know nine thousand or ten thousand years ago, after the Great Cataclysm, there were survivors who came in to South right. America to other places in the world. And uh, and again, I'm not saying that this is absolutely conclusive. This is something that Graham Hancock uh, Graham Hancock talks about, where people who survived a uh, cataclysm who had a lot of ancient knowledge on uh, the stars on different uh, you know different systems of uh, law banking yeah. trade so on and so forth that they ended up uh, coming to other places throughout the world south america sumeria and they were the ones who at least according to the sumerians and the south americans themselves they were the ones who brought civilization they were the ones who kind of, uh, if we were to go down this road, reignited the spark of what once was potentially a global empire. And well, well, we're... Hyper yeah. Hyperborean we're doing... Atlantean refugees. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And are we, we going to do Nephilim too? Yes, we're going to do Nephilim, Nephilim too. <laughs> no, but the interesting <laughs> sure. thing for me here is because I think that this is not really something that's talked about that much in academia as opposed to being more of a fanciful pursuit. But the more that I start to look at all these different, like the scab lands that you see in the upper United States, indicating that there must have been a tremendous impact at that time, as well as the th shared mythology of the uh, of the flood, the great flood that ended up getting rid of a lot of civilizations, well, as well uh, as, yeah. Uh, uh, the guy with Graham Hancock and all the Rogan episodes. Um, yeah, uh, Randall Carlson. 
Grand, Grand Cooley. Grand Cooley. You just got to look at Grand... It, unironically, though, look at pictures of Grand Cooley. It's insane. It's like a giant, giant basin that indicates that, yes, a, a massive amount of water erosion. That's like... If you, if you see it from above, this is like... You know, this is... To to sort of if you if you layer in your mind the water onto the the basin that you're looking at, it's an ungodly amount of it doesn't that amount of water doesn't exist outside of like ocean level of of, of movement and, mm. and especially to do that much erosion right um, yeah he, he he laid it out pretty well on that on that podcast Randall Carson but uh, yeah the, all of these these things the, the asteroid impact. Or rather, the the comet impact on the uh, on the shelf, right? The uh, the ice shelf mm -hmm. over the north North America, and or rather, they say uh, over uh, over Greenland. So, so right? this would have been around the period. Like the, that, mm, gone the thaw the thawing of the younger dryers as well. Yes. Um, I think it's yeah. I think it's very very interesting interesting to think about. You know, in the antediluvian times, much of what now is above water could well have been below. And what was what was below is above, and so we've gone. You know, we've had a great cataclysmic shift. Um, so land masses would have looked fairly different. But what I'm curious about here from Sean is this is a very different conversation, probably. I'm taking a guess than the ones that go on within uh, within academia, uh, because this is I don't know. I would say this is a little bit controversial. This isn't something that would be widely accepted amongst uh you know the uh movers and shakers of the academic world but i'm curious where uh you uh fall into this uh discussion when it comes to these uh you know kind of putting the pieces together on what may have happened uh back then with these ancient civilizations uh starting from not starting from scratch but starting from the things that they may have inherited from uh people who uh came before people who uh may have survived these cataclysms i guess the um this was well put in a tv series that the bbc did uh just a, two or three years ago called civilizations with a, an s and it was a deliberate sort of remake of an idea of something originally done in the early 70s which was essentially a history of western art uh, yeah and kenneth it, clark it, yeah and it's club um, mm. civilization mm. interestingly um it wasn't originally to be called civilization um it was simply to be called a history of western art and the controller of bbc2 one david attenborough yes it is he um suggested civilization would be a better uh, a better name and of course in that is such a huge cultural assumption that western art equals civilization and that is civilization and although it didn't never stated it but the clear assumption is that anything else is either not as in, not as good or not as important or peripheral uh you know another yeah another form of civilization but the main one is is this one so simon sharma and david olashoga and mary beard made this series uh, about two or three years ago in which they did exactly this that what that you're talking about and they uh you know they, they took e they weren't working together, they, they each had their own individual programs, but they were going back to these very earliest civilizations. And the mess, the overall message was, apart from their own individual enthusiasms, was that they are various different civilizations and they are all of equal uh, status, importance, interest, uh, vital vitality, and so on. And in terms of what's, of course, the, the phrase which is used in academia uh, is about decolonizing the curriculum. Um, I mean, this is very much clearly part of that that, that process of um, deprivileging de de um, the, the Western canon. And in that sense, yes, you, you're, you're quite right. This is something which is being debated and it takes it can uh, it can arise in all sorts of different and unexpected areas. So it can be in literature, it can be in the teaching of mathematics, it can be in uh, the teaching of, I don't know, Tudor England, um, you know, all sorts of areas where you might not have thought it would be an issue, it comes up. Um, and I suppose the one which has most surprised me, since we're, again, talking about early civilizations, not quite as early as that, but even so, um, is about the Anglo-Saxons. Um, and uh, I just, only today I saw those as there's an article relating to that film, The Dig. I don't know if uh, any of you saw it, but it's uh, it tells the yeah, story I did. Of, of the. I haven't uh, watched it, but I want the, to. Yeah. The Sutton Hoo ship. Um, and one of the themes in, in the film, which is this 
beautifully shot um, thing in the Suffolk countryside is, is this ship Viking or is it Saxon? And, ba and Basil, um, I can't think of his first name, his surname, um, Brown, the, the man who, 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 uh, dug it, who excavated it, was, is convinced that it's Saxon. Now, you might, you know, watching the film, why does it matter? But it sort of latches into we were, what we were talking about, um, the idea of a, uh, an identity, of an ancestors, people, and all the rest of it. And if it's Saxon, it really is sort of getting into the sort of nature of Englishness in a way that it wouldn't quite if it was Viking. It's not a big thing in the film, but it is there. And the article was suggesting that this was um, controversial, um, that the very term Anglo-Saxon, because in the American context, it's, it's, you know, it's part of the wasp thing. And so it's got uh, it's got racial connotations um, and that has sort of been imported or people are trying to import it over here in a totally different context, um, you know, where it's essentially you're, you're suggesting that a whole part of the history of these islands is can be sort of written off. Um, so, you know, this is this is the sort of way in which these debates about very early civilizations, the origins of us, I suppose, where we trace our ancestry to, um, is is moving into this realm of controversy um, of not just cultural appropriation but cultural identity and the the sort of equal respect given to different types of culture and therefore and this is where I think it's uh, it's in danger, not just de-privileging certain ones but actually sort of disapproving of them putting them down so you get a sort of reverse effect of the cultural mm. outlook of the heyday of empire which did indeed privilege certain ones and looked at others as as uh, uh, less worthy and i see the same thing beginning to happen only this time um in reverse yeah, that's well, why I, I, i'm not I a fan agree. of mary beard myself to tell you the right. truth because of that because i feel that um, actually, she's leading the way for like this very, like I don't know, progressive outlook of like pop British history. I, <laughs> I don't I, mean I don't, to insult your colleague. That may, maybe the, that may be nearly knocked her off her bike uh, once, actually, Jill, when in Cambridge. I was reversing the car. <laughs> and I Mary B behind yeah. me. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 like the, I quite like the SPQR. It was it was it was very good in my opinion. I, I really like that book. Um, I, I understood kind of the ideological um, uh, sort of. Uh, uh, points uh, i don't know it's like a boat is being pointed in a certain direction i can't really think of the right word but i, mm. I could tell where she, the heading right the heading of of where she was ideologically she's kind of like trying to deconstruct your notions of you know the legends of rome and try to make them be a real people to you and i think that was you know that was interesting but she also i think which was nice still made it clear that the legends of rome are important because they still are those people as well Right. And I, that, that's kind of the point that I was getting to. And, and I think I, I was really, really happy to hear where that what you said ended versus where you started, because I was like, oh, no, this is the what like why? Like I was thinking exactly kind of how you what you said is it makes sense to it, it makes sense for Indian historians to decolonize their historical canon when it's all centered around the West. But it doesn't make sense for British historians do the same, but their own, you know, what I mean, like their own. It doesn't their own history. It it just seems kind of stupid to do. like Indi I don't think Indian historians are going to decolonize their Indian history of India and its, you know, what I mean, like of their culture. Like yeah. they, they're not going to do it to their own. They're just going to do it to yours. Yeah. And that's the that's the well. Even within here. India, there there are like there is oh, a course. problem like with Hindu <laughs> nationalists sort of. Um, Sweeping I'm not, but that's yeah. the thing. I mean, I'm, symp so I'm sympathetic, but it's still like you're sweeping under the yeah. rug, like a lot yeah. of the more problematic aspects of Indian history. I mean, I just don't think yeah, you can equalize easy. these cultures as well. Like in a, in my eyes, Western culture is superior because I am Western, and therefore I prefer to live like this because it's what I know. But yeah, to to, to someone in South Africa, I think there is a criticism, though. Be, no, but there is a criticism. I mean, in the sense. Sorry, I cut you off, Disco. What about South that's Africa? That's all right. No, no, no. Well, to, to them, they live in a different way, and, and that's superior to them because it suits their blood, basically. It suits the way they, they fundamentally understand. Like um, Lev was talking about with ley lines and, and this sort of thing, I, I do think we are attached to the land, and, so, and there's this sort of unseen and unheard element of our lives that, that you know, we're from a place, and... 
you can't really get away from that. And the cosmopolitans try to um, and end up sort of rationalising everything. And now we, like Sean was talking about, we see this reverse colonialization where, um, you know, what was uh, Western is now denigrated in like, and um, sort of non-Western cultures are put up on a pedestal. So in this civilizations program, they can't equalize all these cultures because it depends who's looking at it. In my opinion, they're not equal, but in the opinion of someone else with a different culture, they're also not equal because everyone just prefers their own. What interested me about that program or the concept of it, and you could see what they were trying to do, you could see where they were coming from, and it was all very praiseworthy. But in the end, it was three Westerners looking at various cultures, you know, many of many of which were non-Western. Mm. I think I'd have been more interested to hear what, you know, say, uh, you know, an African historian had to say about, you know, a, about the particular part of African culture. As indeed, I can think of a, a superb series done by uh, a sort of British African historian a few years ago called The Lost Kingdoms of Africa. Uh, if you if you ever look it up, it is absolutely magnificent. And, and, and there was something there, uh, it was because he was of African origin himself, that's what made it so powerful. Rather than having Mary Beard or whoever it might be coming in, essentially as an outsider to talk about someone else's culture, um, I think yeah, if, you, exactly. if you're going to do this, mm -hmm. I'd much rather hear about it from the people who, who grew up with it and who can talk about it from within themselves. Yeah, I, I, would, I, don't I would be careful. A thing oh. that's just oh, look at what these quaint Africans did uh, back in the day. Like it's way more interesting to watch somebody who's like, wow, like I'm I'm standing in a place that I'm connected to, not just mm -hmm. from my from my academics and my under and my knowledge and my study, but like my who I am, right? Like all of that comes into play in a different way i'd rather listen to a, a, a british person talk about british history just like i'd rather listen to exactly what you said there yeah. is a there is an interesting uh, balance that could possibly be achieved here when it comes to the uh graham hancock ancient civilizations thing that i was bringing forth in a way it goes to the uh opposite direction of uh, some of the things we're seeing today in academia that attempt to decolonize culture because the uh, the point that's being made here is that there may have been a time before where a lot of these cultures were colonized and they were colonized by an empire that was uh, an antediluvian empire that stretched, you know, across uh, the entire world, mostly coastal civilizations, which then ended up uh, passing away after the cataclysm and people had to start all over. Now, what that would imply then is that there are elements within each of these uh, cultures all over the world that retain that shared bond of having been exposed to whatever this uh, this may have been. There were, uh, for example, I, I mean, I don't know, like you could take a look at uh, the way that we have uh, pyramids all over the place, that mm. the way that we have, for example, in even China, and this is not something that the Chinese government uh, wants people to pay that much attention to, but they do have pyramids in yeah. China. And recently there was a comment from Jeff over here. This reminds me of controversy around the Qin excavation in China, attempting to talk about chariots, not as something brought in by steepy invaders, but as an auto I can't say this word, autothonos, people who created them. I'm not sure what aut autothonos is. I'm not sure if that word was correctly spelled. But uh, uh, suffice it to say, these uh, various examples of people coming in and bringing something interesting into these uh, cultures, I think this is something that should be taken a look at. The problem today, though, is that we have people who make their living off of, let's say, being within a certain part of academia, like, let's say, uh, being an archaeologist and having to uh, make sure that your our reputation as an archaeologist remains uh, stable, so that if something comes around and discredits you, even though I want to keep in mind that people could be open-minded, people have to make money, people have to sell the way that uh, they see the world. They and need so, to sell a narrative. Exactly. And so yeah, I like, look at the, if you look at the Piltdown Man, so the Piltdown Man for half a century was taken as gospel. Um, and, then, and then it was found that actually it was a complete lie and they took a bone from an orangutan. Really? Mm. Yeah, and... And so, you know, archaeology, I think, is one of the most mired sort of and uh, agenda driven um, 
academic studies that that exist and that's why this and i think going forward the antediluvian idea of of civilizations that collapsed um all of a sudden and then there were these sort of survivors of the civilization dispersed around the world is going to be explored a lot more like you know robert sepper so he does he does quite good stuff on youtube about it so as, does graham, as does graham hancock um uh and the sequencing of the human genome in 20 was it 2014 or something like that is now revealing um this this idea that we weren't these disparate uh cultures that were completely separated and actually there was um communication and the seas for instance were easily traversed back in the day and that was proven by thor heyerdahl uh, the norwegian i think it was back in the 50s or something like that where he he sailed on like a bamboo raft from the west coast of south america all the way to the polynesia in like 100 days simply by using the trade winds and um you know knowing the the right passage and it becomes a highway it's not it's not this big blockade that we think it is it's a it's a literal highway and you can and you can traverse it um which is and he was doing the contiki which is basically you know the the and um the incans yeah the incas in the andes uh they worshipped tiki and so did the polynesians and it, it seemed like the same god basically god i mean the same sort of civilizational founder um so and I think this is going to happen going forward. There's far more interest now than I've ever seen before in this in this idea that we've have this forgotten history uh, well, and it's be being discovered. Well, before before uh, moving on, I'm curious, uh, Sean, if you would have any response to that. Mm -hmm. If there have been stirrings of the similar type that Disco was referring to within uh, academia. Can I add something after? after sure. This one? Yeah. Well, you're a little bit before my my period. <laughs> you're going into antediluvian, so I don't want to don't want to <laughs> get too far. Um, this is the University of Twitter. All oh, right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's fine institution. <laughs> with Twitter. Yeah. Um, yes. But I think the idea, the sort of tension, if you like, between that which is in common and that which is diffuse um, and and uh, and. Uh, and varied in terms of cultural identity at its very origins. Um, you know, it, it's a never-ending um, uh, issue, this one. I mean, to some extent, it's even about the difference between the present and the past. You know, um, historians always stress the, how the past is different, and yet at the same time, there are important things which, which are held in common. And of course, underneath all of that, um, this argument about the nature of a, some sort of antediluvian culture is the idea of a common um, human identity. And that does take you straight to the current debates about uh, about who about lives that matter and uh, and the sort of common uh, well the, the sort of respect I suppose that that's accorded to people of which, whichever culture. That's the best I can do very quickly. But as I say, you've, you've got you've got me a little bit out, outside my area. <laughs> no, no, I, I completely understand. Which is why I don't want to dwell on it too much. I want BTR to be the kind of place where we can introduce people uh, within more professional fields such as yourself to a lot of these ideas that are going around. On Twitter right now because this is one of the things that I think uh, when we were asking before what does it mean to be British what does it mean to be this that I think people today are looking back at what may have been something much more perennial that uh, connect them and I think that is a very interesting thing and we have myself aka Ewan joining us right now Ewan, before yeah, we yeah. Ewan but before we get to Ewan I wanted Disco to also just say one more thing about the ley lines because that was written in your book and I gotta say there may be a bit of a poem bone that i want to pick what that particular notion of the ley lines you know the, like just being like these uh things that don't really uh matter or, like people give their own definition of what they are but uh i don't know i just wanted disco if he can to touch a little bit on why that may not be the case why ley lines may be an actual important uh element of nature of spirit whatever you want to call it and has there been any way of proving so or is this pretty much just a just trust me bro type of thing at this point yeah my my whole vibe is trust me bro uh <laughs> there are there are no sources in my opinion but um yeah ley lines are energetic tracks essentially and they, they 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 meet at points you know these lines come to points and they they become energetic centers um <clears throat> 
Uh, I can't remember what I wrote in my book uh, now, but I'd have to actually read it again. Um, but what I will say, and this is going to, it's a bit out of left field, is if you look at a ley line map on a regular globe Earth, it just looks a bit like, well, it doesn't really make any sense. It's just these interweaving lines crossing each other. But if you look at a ley line map on a flat Earth, it looks like on a flat Earth map, sorry, if you look at ley lines on a flat Earth map, it looks like the flower of life. Uh, so I just thought that was interesting. Now, I am not in the flat earth <laughs> camp, just so, just so you know, but uh, I don't know, a lot, a lot of this stuff, a lot of this stuff is, is, yeah. is, yeah, is we all just go meant a map, the, uh... not like actual flat earth, although who knows, I mean, <laughs> no, we all I'm, know I'm just saying the it's... earth isn't flat, but it is hollow, we can all agree on the that. Earth is hollow, yes, yes. and the earth is, is down Actually, there, no, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, no, but... I did want to, I did want to add something, though, um, I don't know if you've uh, ever um, looked into the work of Robert Schock. And his whole like erosion on the Sphinx thing, uh, and the idea that um, that monument is like way, way, way older than almost all the other stuff that that is built in Egypt. Like he, he he's a geologist who studied the Sphinx a little bit. He looked at it and he was like, "That's that's water erosion on the side of this thing. Like that's." And that's rain erosion. And he measured it, and it was like this: this, the amount of rain that would be required to erode this this much is like monsoon level rain. And there hasn't been monsoon level rain in that area of the world for like ten thousand years. You know what I mean? So yeah, um, the implication is there right now. He could be wrong, I guess. Um, but I, 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 honest, I, I trust the geologist to understand how how water interacts with rock over um, the archaeologist. That may sound strange, but I just do. Um, the man studies rocks versus studies um, the things that come out of the ground, right? And uh, I think that in and of itself, if that's true, that's basically... That, that I don't know that upends like the whole paradigm of what's going on even just in Egypt and and generally like Gobekli Tepe is another example of something very very strange um that Sean, at least Sean you've seen the... Gobekli Tepe I just want to make sure we're on the same page of what we're talking about have you seen Gobekli Tepe uh afraid not no but there's, oh, okay. there's another there's a parallel example I've got in mind for um which I think will is relevant uh, but I'll, no, let let, um, let ribs finish finish. Um, yeah. So yeah, these ideas that these are these are if if the Sphinx thing is true, and especially if uh, well, lo just looking at Gobekli like Tepe at all, right? That's a that's an endeavor. That's like what hunter gatherers are going to be doing this? Mm -hmm. Like this is this is Gobekli Tepe, by the way. This yeah. Is why it. would you be making megalithic <laughs> sites? For like when you're a hunt, like what? Like the, 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 it doesn't even it doesn't even make sense at all in the traditional paradigm of understood history. Like it, the the sort of assumption is that civilization just sort of begun uh, or began rather, you know, uh, at a certain point in the in this valley area or like Mesopotamia or it's, you know Sumer. Like what it could have, you know, uh, we're not quite. You know exactly the spot but it, around here is the oldest that we have but then you have these megalithic sites that are like this isn't even this is this is enormous and yeah. very intricate and extremely detailed and it has to do with the, the you know the stars and like the the, the their depictions of the, the of the um of the of the i guess the, the like the, the Procession of the uh, pr procession of yeah, the, yeah, equinoxes. the procession of equinox and yeah, yeah and, and the constellations <clears throat> and all of that. Astrotheology. Right? Like, yeah. So these things themselves, I, I think they kind of it's not necessarily that they're new. Robert Shock thing is kind of new, I guess, for academia. Like uh, I don't know, new to academia is it, it seemingly from somebody who's looking from the inside out. New is something that happened ten years ago. Like it takes a long time for these things to sort of like become 
non-jokes, like things that are just dismissed out, outright. It seems like a lot of information is just kind of like, yeah, no, we would have looked at that if that was worth anything. You know what I mean? Um, but, you know, I don't, I'm not inside, so I don't know. Well, but one, these, one these, other these things, yeah. specifically, yeah, Go Back to Tepe is, is one that you should probably, at least, at le everyone should at least look at. It's kind of insane. Well, it's uh, at least 9,000 years old, and it was intentionally buried 9,000 years ago. That's why we know at least it's 9,000 years old, this place, and it was buried in Turkey. And uh, a very interesting thing to me about all this stuff is that if you take a look, and Robert Suffer in his videos also talked about it, and this is not antediluvian history, this would be more recent history. If we take a look at cultures that honored, let's say, the bull, and then cultures that mm. honored the ram, where you would have statues of bulls and you would have statues of rams. Yeah. That, se that seems, at least according to Robert and other people who have uh, uh, made this point, that this is astrology, that they are paying homage to a certain era that they were born into, according to exactly. the procession of the equinoxes. So we're and in the, the age of yeah. Pisces now, um, and the bull, the Mithraic <coughs> mysteries and that sort of stuff, they're in the age of Taurus. Um, so that's why the bull was uh, was held up in the highest in esteem, and then the age of Aries was um, the ram. So yeah, I mean it's it, it's a very interesting thing for me. But uh, Sean, have you looked at? Uh, I mean, I know that well, this is new what as I was far going as to say is, but, yeah. That, I mean, just was talking about ley lines, and the um, I'm not going to get into the detail of the ley line idea, but th this was put forward, I thought, well, I think in the 1930s, um, originally, the idea that there are the lines of communication, uh, very, very ancient lines. And what I'm getting at is that there are two things, two searches, if you like, which are both in the uh, debate about ley lines and also in the sort of meaning of these very ancient sites. Partly, it's a physical thing. Um, what were the actual uh horizons and how far did the world of individuals at that time extend how far literally could they go did they have a sense of direction and these sort of lines of communication and you know we have found tra uh, traces of tracks which suggest that they had surprisingly sophisticated um communication networks as it were um so that the, the physical connect connectivity um, was was possible and the other is the spiritual um what's you know it, how what's the connection between their sort of um geographical world and their and the, their con concept their sort of spiritual concept of of themselves and the heavens and where they fitted in now the example i'm going to bring in here is stonehenge because it is obviously it's a well-known one and it it brings all of these issues together um partly because of where it is it's in line with the rising and the setting of the sun and the equinox and all the time there's been this uh, great debate, all these endless arguments about what it means, what its spiritual meaning is. And just recently, um, there's been a bit of a breakthrough in the archaeology um, uh, connected with Stonehenge. So they've worked out not just where some of the standing stones came from, which is South Wales, um, but how they, they, they're pretty certain how, how they were transported. So you begin to get, first of all, the, um, uh, the physical um, can it, you know, could it have been done? This is the Thor Heyerdahl idea that Disco was talking about earlier, the same sort of, you recreated. And sure enough, uh, and they worked out it wasn't done by water. It, do, it is done on land. It's not done with rollers. Um, it, it basically, it's a sort of wooden sledge idea. Yes, you'd be surprised, um, you know, how, how um, feasible that is. Then following on from that is the mean, you know, what's the spiritual meaning? And the uh, and why would they do it? Why would you move stones all the way from South Wales to Salisbury Plain in order to do it? And you sort of think it through. Hang on, um, stay sensible a moment. Um, almost certainly, the people are moving. It's a part of a migration, which seems to make sense. Why would you carry stones with you, ancestors? Do these stones represent the ancestors whom you don't want to leave behind, whom you do need to bring with you? And by th there's a sort of um, symbiosis, I suppose, between the the spiritual meaning, the logistical, technical, you know, and technical possibilities, the geography, all of these things together, and underneath all of it, I think, is this the modern mind trying to get into the thinking of the very, very ancient mind, um, in a way which is partly so foreign to us. The idea of the stones being your ancestors, you take them with you, um, that might seem very foreign. But at the same time, 
it's actually surprisingly modern and like us. And this is, I think, one of the hardest things for us to take on board. A, the, techni the technological aspect, um, because you can apply exactly the same engineering thinking now as then. And you see how very similar their minds were to ours. But even the spiritual um, is much more like us because we may not have stones as our ancestors around us, but we have equivalents uh, in the form of photographs, in the form of memories, in the form of memorials, in the form of the things that we keep alive and that we want our, our, our children to know about um, because that is part of who we are. And that, I think, links up with all the debate we were having earlier about what is the nature of, a, you know, in this case, it was Britishness, but it could be any nationality, because, you know, that sort of ancestor veneration is absolutely part of it. So underneath all of these examples, these very different examples from the ancient world, from the very ancient world, I think we're actually touching something very modern, which is about identity, which is about who, uh, in a sense, we think we are and how different we are but actually how similar we are to the most different people in our ancestry who are the very earliest ones. There is also one more thing I would add to that, and I think it completely relates to what you were talking about, remembering the ancestors, remember what happened before, that with, let's say, the position of the Sphinx uh, at the constellation of Leo at, I don't remember how many, many years ago this was, but the point here is that you have these monuments that trace positions of the star within a, a certain constellation of the zodiac which acts as a giant calendar and that acts as a calendar not for years but we're talking spans of thousands of years so the procession of the equinox how much is that is that 20 around twenty six thousand years i believe and that people back then would have been so interested as to uh monument that specific uh that specific thing i think it speaks to a greater vision than just uh doing things in the here and now it seems like they were very much concerned and i haven't looked in stonehenge but it seems like they were very much concerned about uh the grand scheme of things where we are in relation to everything else same thing you could say with the bach tunes of uh and i'm not too familiar with the way it works so i'm curious if uh, uh yushan or disco or remus or anybody would like to comment on this but the mayan calendar as far as how galactic time works there i don't know i'm not that familiar with that uh remus do you know anything about that or uh not enough to to speak confidently but it kind of reminds me of the yugas and stuff like that you know what i mean like it's it's the, and they're always speaking of cyclical time that's the most important part right. i think partly because mm -hmm. even if you just think about it in a purely material sense when you look up the sky is a wheel essentially it's rotating um on a central point that you can kind of track if you're smart enough um and that's strange right like just that fact is weird and just as professor lang was saying you know they have the same mind that we did or that we do so if you can notice that they can notice that and if you can find it compelling and interesting so can they and i think we just i think people just do this really stupid thing where they just assume that ancient people are dumb like yeah. for some yeah. reason and it's like you're a moron man they're way smarter than you probably because they have to figure they actually have to figure things out like it's not that i'm venerating their you know their brilliant i don't think necessarily they could deal with living in a fucking modern world either it'd be very hard for them right living but, in the pod eating the bugs yeah exactly they could not eat, live God. in the pod and eat the bugs they would they would they would freak out live in the but, yurt Eat the uh, yeah. unprocessed green. Yeah, eat the, right the raw meat. Yeah, eat the that's raw. a little bit better. <laughs> but uh, you know, in this regard, I think it's um, that, that's my favorite part about history is that it, it like you have a misconception about the past, right? Because of the way in which a lot of these things are communicated to you by pop culture and by propaganda propagandization. Honestly, like there's this hmm. really really giant. Um, push to make sure that you think that the, the time that you're living in is the fucking greatest ever. Yeah. The bee's knees. Oh my we're god, the, it could never get best, better. Right? The best yeah, of yeah. all possible like, worlds. Yeah. In, in many ways, I think that's that's true. We are we are living in a way that's unprecedented for humans, at least to our knowledge, right? Like, um, but the the idea again that these people are incompetent or like intelligent and capable of 
understanding the world in ways that we don't is, is I think the pitfall of a lot of this. And, and, you know, the, yeah, I think there's I, something to the, the, agree. I think, the, I, I think there's saying, something to what you just said, that the, the whole migration, you know, idea of bringing these stones with you because they're representative of something that may, maybe we don't understand. Yes, it could be uh, ancestors, <clears throat> but it could be anything. But uh, I think there's probably some, like, that's a shitload of work. There's probably something deeper to it as well that we, we aren't seeing. And I think also that you're not ruling that out at all. Um, which, which is, you know, is fair and I have to give credit, but, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. These things are, it, there's too much, to, like, there's too many things it, like, for, for example, with the, with the, with the Sphinx, if it was just the water erosion, but it's not just the water erosion, it's all of the stuff about the Sphinx. It's all of, it's not just one fact. It's all of those things put together that makes them so compelling in these regards. Like, it just seems like like way too much work for something that is simply just like hey we wanted to show you the sky you know what i mean like or mm. we wanted to depict like like it's a picture or something like yeah that's cool but you're gonna like like how many people do you think died making something like a becco teppi or like or stonehenge even I mean, one of the mm. rocks falls you you, you didn't own at least you know I mean? three. Leg breaks, you're dead. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right? so, At least three. You know, you know. Yeah, can well, I... That's the uh, yeah, go ahead. Lev, go ahead. Uh, Lev, can I say one last thing and then I'll, sure. I'll have to go. Sure. Um, so thanks for having me on. This has been really enjoyable. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think our sort of refusal to look at grander cycles of history or um, conceive that our ancestors weren't morons um, pushes us into... <clears throat> this further desire for instant gratification, or at least that's sort of emblematic of it. And so, we're, you know, now we live in this best time where we can have things right on our fingertips here and now. Yes, 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 give it to me. And it's, you know, and it's this, this sort of cancerous replication of this thought process that feeds into why, why we can't conceive of, of what it might have been like 12,000 years ago. And we think, no, 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 they're just like numbskulls uh, and anyway we all came from this primordial soup basically and so we, we thank god for the agricultural revolution and i would say the agricultural revolution wasn't the start of history it was the end of history um mm -hmm. no yeah, not really. <laughs> <laughs> um that's just an anti-grain post um <laughs> but yeah no that's it basically um thanks for having me it's been great Thank uh, you. Can I shame? Can I shamelessly plug? Absolutely. Go right. Go right ahead. Did you read it, Lev? I have not read it yet. I was staying up all night working on my uh, newest Lev card, which I'm going to premiere today at the NFT stream at six o'clock. But uh, I look forward to reading it. Beautiful. Uh, beautiful. All right. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Um, you can you can get it if you go to my Twitter uh, at Disco Orpheus. It's on my bio. Uh, I'm not using Amazon because obviously they don't support uh, Big Zog. But um, yeah, so that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, um, Beautiful you cover, take... by the way, with the uh, with the deer. This is a Scythian tattoo, I believe. It is. That's right. Yeah. It also, um, and I didn't realize this until someone pointed it out to me. It looks like a heart, which is quite cool. In the shape, like an actual art, you know, an mm. anatomical art mm. with the valves and everything. So, very, yeah. very cool. Excellent. Uh, so it, was, it was lovely to speak to you, all you guys. Thank you lovely, very much. Lovely Thank to you. speak to you too. Yeah, now, I'll, uh, I'll chat to you soon. Now, Sean, I know we took a lot of time right now talking about antediluvian things of that nature, but I want to go back, uh, if possible, to uh, more, let's say, recent history, which is still not recent history. And for that, I wanted to go to myself and, if possible, trace myself's origins as far as his history goes. So myself, you are also in England. Yes. Uh, c can you tell us a little bit about, without doxing yourself, where you are, so from there we can get a better idea of what life was like for your ancestors? Well, I don't know. I came from, what is it? I have like two sides of the family i'm like half english and half scottish but then i don't really know too much more than that because i the whole uh, i just did some press ups while you guys were like talking so that's I'm a little out of breath but uh it's kind of half english half scottish and there's like i don't know much but it's just i feel like a lot of the culture around that kind of stuff was kind of suppressed 
that so I don't really know much about my family to be honest like further than like my grandparents and stuff like that like just English and Scottish really I don't know mm. well going back to English people Scottish people even though these are different cultures in the sense what are certain things that we may take a look at uh, I guess to pick a date during the Middle Ages, and that's still very broad, I guess, but I'm trying to figure out what day can we pick where things wouldn't be that horrible in terms of actually going back and living the life of a uh, medieval English peasant, and what things would have been like in terms of diet, what things would have been like in terms of one's activity, how occupied was the mind, the human mind of the uh, average uh, medieval English peasant at the time, because uh, I think a lot of people, again, pointing to what was talked about before with people having this impression of people who existed, you know, before Enlightenment as just being these absolute brutes. I want to see if there is a way that we can shed a little, a little bit more light on what exactly was going on with the lives of these people, the way that they cared for their uh, family, and the way, that they, the way that they saw the world, basically. How different were they from us, and were the experiences that they lived in back then something that would be completely unimaginable to us with all our uh, creature comforts, or is this something that has elements that are missing from today? And again, it goes back to what I was talking about in the very beginning of this episode. How can we integrate all the good things about the past without having, like, uh, Sean, you said yourself, uh, your gr uh, grandfather who, you know, f did not want to have surgery from uh, f from an Indian fella. So that's, th that's what I'd love to figure out. When you talk about going back into the past to see what life would be like, it's always a tricky one because, um, of course, the person going back in the past is you today. So you would see the past as a visitor rather than being in it. And, and inevitably, we see it through, through modern eyes. Incidentally, um, I've always taken the view that um, when people say which part of the, of the, of the past would you like to live in, I always say today, um, because you only have to think about no dental care to see that, you know, I'd rather live today. But I've changed my mind just recently. I think I'd settled for two years ago before the pandemic. Then that would be a very nice time <laughs> to live in. You know? Um, I know the way that feels like cheating when you answer that. Uh... <laughs> but in terms of the medieval outlook and, and life, um, well, we have a real insult, I think, for the middle, middle, medieval period. I mean, even the term actually is, was originally an insult by the Renaissance period people, you know, just a time in between. Um, and we often use the term medieval to mean brutal and uh, barbaric in a way that any medieval historian would, you know, would be up in arms about, and rightly so. Because it's a dreadful caricature that we have of a period of time, after all, which, I mean, when does it begin? Uh, you know, if you sort of talk about the Anglo-Saxon period as the early me medieval, you're looking at about five or six hundred years. It's a it's a very, very long, long period um, to, to get this sort of caricature. But in general terms, Lev, to answer your question, I, I think um, the f there's so much which is similar, as there always is, as we've just been talking about, even going back to the very earliest period. So let's take that as red. But the biggest difference, I suppose, has got to be uh, the relationship with the spiritual world, the ever-present reality of uh, of God, of angels, of evil, um, the idea that the world of the stars up there and the world right down here in the most parochial and local sense are absolutely connected. And I think it's beautifully encapsulated if you think of a, the building of a church. I don't, I don't mean the process of building it, but I mean what it actually looks like, particularly if it's got a steeple. Uh, a tower will do, but a steeple even better, because it's like a, it's like a sort of point of contact. It's almost like um, you know Michelangelo, the the creation of, of of Adam, you know, with the fingers just about touching. And the steeple is the connection between your tiny little village and the world of heaven. And that reality, when you would go into a building which is just round the corner, you know, you live in its shadow. And of course, you also got to bear in mind that it would be the tallest building. Um, until he got into the towns and, and the churches there. So again, the sheer physical bulk is part of it. But the idea that there is a miracle which takes place in your local church every Sunday and a bell rings so that wherever you are, you, you know it's happening. And the whole, everything in the building is designed, is painted, is, is laid out to stress the sort of magic um, and the, the, uh, the incense and the candles and the, the vestments and everything about that to, to sort of talk about a miracle which takes place every single week in your 
little village. And that sort of fusion of the very local, the, the literally parochial, um, the, the mundane and everyday and the cosmic is, I think, something which is, although you can find it even today, of course, I'm not saying it's, it's peculiar to the Middle Ages, but it has a reality and it has a sort of general acceptance, which is um, lost, I suppose, at the Enlightenment. Um, but is absolutely, uh, I, I always find when I'm teaching about, about this period, is the hardest thing to help students get across in order to understand, which is why I nearly always begin with a big thing about, uh, <clears throat> about spirituality uh, before we get on to you know, kings or wars or anything like that, because then you get into the mind. And this sort of looking for the light in your world um, I'm not saying that there's no light in the world. I'm not sort of suggesting that the Middle Ages is a period of darkness, but the sort of looking for an inner light and um, and that it can be found on Earth. And this is where those famous medieval maps come in, because, of course, they bear no relation to, to geography, as we understand it, because they're spiritual. They're, they are about the relationship between the spiritual world and the geographical and, um, you know, territorial world, with Jerusalem at the centre of the Earth. Um, and that is also, of course, the thinking behind the voyages, you know, of, of whom of, of which Columbus is the best known. But they are essentially sort of spiritual voyages as well as geographical. So the geography and spirituality are very, very closely entwined. And I think that is what is characteristic of the medieval period if we're going to generalize, which inevitably we are. I can also say that uh, this may be going out into the weeds a bit and i know for the people who are sick to death of me talking about my meditation i'm not going to talk about the meditation i'm just gonna say real quickly that this image that i posted over here it has uh the uh, dome with the light on it this is from the vatican mm -hmm. it has just a regular church and it also has a uh, shiva well, dancing around the ring of life and well, it has it's the period yeah. that slaughter day called the heliospheric that one. era yeah of history that is like the archetypal sort of the the motif the current that runs through all thinking of that era uh, but but is, i wouldn't say just of, of that era i'd say that this is something that if you oh. if you if you let's say sit down somewhere and start meditating you're probably going to see this so the two mm. images above over here the five pointed star with the halo the one to the uh right this is the one that i drew myself in a photoshop after an experience that i had meditating so the reason why i'm mentioning this and putting all these images together here is that i think my guess is that people who were left out without that much distraction back in the old days they had time to think they had time to ruminate and they had time to go within and because of that they may have been privy to the same things that uh, if uh, you were to go out and meditate, you would also see. And I think uh, going back to what we were talking about earlier, this may be something that can uh, connect us to something beyond us without necessarily having to go somewhere except for uh, within, which is why it's always going to be accessible to everybody. So that was just a short, a short <laughs> rant on, uh, how, them, <laughs> on how on how I see these uh, all these things being connected. Yeah. I, I think well, there's something to this. Even the forms, right? I think there's something to it. Um, you know, it, it's the kind of thing where I think you did say, you know, this this still exists. But yes, most people I think are kind of larping like the, nowadays. You know what I mean? Like the, they're they're kind of doing the thing because they think that they're supposed to do the thing rather than because they wholeheartedly believe in the thing. Like, I think most people that are getting communion don't literally believe that it's the body and blood of Christ. Um, and maybe the percentage of people that literally believe that it was the body and blood of Christ in the medieval period, um, uh, you know, th that was higher, but um, maybe... But uh, I think that's still, that's that's still present in in, in and and, it, and it's still possible, as Lev is saying, for it to be present for literally anybody at any time. Like um, you know, there's been a sort of a, a t going around topic of a, a, of being in sort of like awe of the divine, right? And and um, that status or that state being being important to attain. And I think that's that's possible all the time. Like you can. You can have this, like, 
what you're saying about the, the church steeple, right, being being the connection to to the sky, essentially, right, and like the the unbounded heavens. Um, there's a way to do this with everything. You can do this with the trees. You can do this with 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 any part of the world that you live in, as long as you are within the right. Like I think there's um, different sort of disciplines that have come at this at different levels, right? You have sort of the, 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 the people that go inside of something and, and try to all like vibe on the same level and, and reach God in that way. There's people who do it alone. There's, there's the aesthetic path. There's, you know, all of these different things. And, but ultimately they're trying to get at that sort of divine ecstatic nature where you're looking at everything and seeing the divine nature and everything. And just like, Oh my God, I can't believe it. It's everywhere. Right. Um, but that that is attainable i think even now like I, I think that that it was probably more likely that people conversed with um what they saw as god all the time right in their mind or or maybe were praying a lot more or like there was a conscious like people talk about the romans being like they, they think about the gods as like it's it's now it's always it's constantly happening it's you know it when the wind knocked the thing out of your hand that was the gods that did that um in real time and you acknowledge it as such like you would it would almost be like you curse the god that did it as he does it right like and uh there's um you know another another thing that i enjoyed is the idea of the 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 reverence is there but it's also a sense of like there's a vindictive nature of, of people towards their gods like they get mad at them and have like tussles or or almost like uh like spats where I'm not, I'm not going to give any devotion to you because you, you betrayed me on the time that I need. Like I, you know, I was praying to the goddess of love for whatever thing and the thing went catastrophically failed. So now I'm going to like scorn this goddess and, 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 and kind of like keep her, you know, at arm's length because she didn't do the thing that I asked, even though I did the things that I was supposed to do uh, or what the priest told me to do or whatever fucking thing, you know what I mean? Uh, this idea, I think that would be cool if there was there was more richness in life in that way. It would be interesting. It would be funny to see people shit posting about their patron goddess not doing what they want. You know what I mean? And crying about it, like, man, I, 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 I sacrificed whatever amount of things to, uh, you know, a start, and she, you know, I didn't. I, I asked the girl and I struck out completely, and now I'm, you know, now I'm, you know, uh, I'm no longer best friends with. Uh, with, with the goddess of start and then I'm, I'm cool with a different pantheon or something like that well uh, it, it, it this, was this kind of thing doesn't exist you're right it was something that i also read in uh british history for dummies where you had people who worshipped their gods and then all of a sudden uh they got invaded and at that point it's like what was the point what was the point of devoting all this attention to this god where you were yeah. now let down like i don't I know maybe they didn't me. pray hard enough yeah, yeah. People, yeah, people reveal themselves at their uh, worst moments. They reveal who they really are and what they really believe in. My well, when, uh, Aries is... did not deliver me the enemy waifu of my dreams. So yeah, exactly. So <laughs> now I am now I am a patron of Dionysius. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> uh, Aries is no longer my best friend. <laughs> I knew you were gonna say that. Friend. Like literally, literally though. Like what? Well, that didn't work. So now I'm gonna go with a different patron who who does a different thing and see if that works. Right, like that, that we don't have that one mostly because um, mono, you know, monoculture and monotheism, right? We only have, we have, we only have one guy to blame, and he doesn't really like. There's no real like back and forth. Like you just lose every time. You can't like you can't get your revenge on on the Judeo Christian Lord. He just sort of like, laughs at you while you sit like are, are having a hard time. He's like, okay, it's, it'll be fine later. Just relax. What's the, right? uh, what's the, uh, I, I want to say it was a Gnostic thing where they had the, uh, the false God. Was it, uh, Demi Rouge. Rouge. There it is. The Demi Rouge. Yes. No, Dem Demi Urge. Demi Urge. Is it Rouge yeah. or Urge? No, Urge. Demi Urge. Rouge, Demi -urge. Is, Rouge is Rouge the Bat. I mean, don't get me started oh, on Rouge the Bat. Oh, <laughs> no, no. no. No, never actually Sean, yeah, do you know who do you know who Rouge the then. Bat is? I'm learning, Lev, I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see they're oh, chaos <laughs> okay, no, 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 please, please have mercy. Oh. No, 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 no. I wanna go back uh because this is a rare opportunity. I'm really thankful for Sean being here. I want to go back to 
this idea of a life in medieval England. There is this connection, like you mentioned, Sean, of having this uh, spiritual, uh, you know, spiritual essence that's not as uh, concrete today. But what else in terms of, let's say, the way that people ate and the way that people got along with each other? Because there is, again, this idea of everybody was brutes back then. The husbands always beat their wives up on a regular basis. And there are things to uh, declare that to be so in certain areas like Russia, for example, that was a regular occurrence among the uh, serfs there. But as far as familial life goes in, um, you know, in, and it's hard to generalize, but in general, for well, the okay. sake of generalizing. I think I think it's three. Uh, one is that this is a hierarchical mindset uh, and the hierarchy goes throughout society right within the family. So if you're talking about relationships of uh, husband and wife, then that is part of a hierarchy which places the man above the woman, the uh, adult above the child. Uh, but also, um, the, it, everyone is in a sort of relationship to someone above them. Uh, I mean, medieval people, for example, didn't have surnames, um, usually. Uh, that develops. But the surname is usually either a description, i.e. the sort of work that you do, or your relationship to someone, you know, Williamson, son of William, that sort of thing. Um, but also, of course, you had a lord, you had someone who was your lord, and that was part of the way you, you were identified. So the, the relic we have of that is the way that uh, Mr. doesn't tell you if you're uh, married or not, Mrs. does. It's a little sort of relic of, of that idea that people are identified in relation to where they stand to someone else. So that's one, um, one aspect, you know, the, uh, the hierarchical one. Um, Secondly, it's a world which is much more in tune with nature and the, and the rhythms of nature than ours is. Now, that's not purely medieval. Of course, that goes right up to the, um, to the Industrial Revolution. That's what breaks that one. But I think, I think that is something which, again, would strike us as very different from the way we live. Uh, I mean, I'm sitting here. Um, it's dark over here. Um, and that wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't do that. Um, in those days, because it would be a waste of uh, of energy, you know. Um, so you follow the seasons, you follow the um, the, the trajectory of the sun um, in the course of your of your ordinary day. So that that would be another difference. And I suppose the third one, apart from the spiritual one we were talking about earlier, um, is connected with hierarchy. In fact, it is very closely connected with hierarchy, which is uh, deference, um, that accepting of your position. Um, and that I, th I always think that is probably the biggest difference between the very modern age, and I mean late 20th century into, into 21st, not even particularly early 20th century, that acceptance of your lot and of your position and not kicking against it. We are a whole society which is based on the idea that you can advance, you can be what you want to be, you get education and it will lift you up, it will take you somewhere other than where you are. Whereas trying to get into a mindset which is essentially you are here you you're not likely to move very far from here except for a particular thing like a pilgrimage or or war uh, but then you come back and this is your whole world and you mentioned russia of course it's brilliantly encapsulated in the word mir um which is both the russian word for world and for a village a space station as well but that's by the way um and and the idea that the, the village is your world although it's particularly long lasting in Russia, but in the medieval, in medieval Europe, it would be instantly recognized. Um, so yeah, it's the horizons are different. Um, many of the, um, the, the sort of understanding of your relationship to the world around you, to the spiritual world and so on is different. And yet we've been concentrating on the differences. Um, and so you were talking about food and, uh, and and the ordinary things of life. And of course, that, again, would be following the natural. So, um, you know, the, the foods we know that the foods are very are, are significantly different from what um, we eat now. Even uh, things like meat and vegetables that you might think are the same are not the same then. Um, but it's not a manufactured type of food. So, again, it's part of that fitting in with the natural process of life. Um, and yet at the same time, you've got the continuities. Uh, and this is what really comes out. I mean, I, I as a as a kid, I used to, you asked me at the very beginning, you know, what switched me on to history. And one thing I've forgotten is, um, as a child, I got I used to go into the British Museum and the medieval manuscripts. I loved just looking, um, you know, in detail at these beautifully painted um, uh, images that you have. And of course, what you see there makes you laugh because you're recognizing exactly the same as yourself. 
and the expressions on people's faces and the things they're getting up to and the failures that they have. That's the common humanity bit. And as you know, we were saying earlier, it's this tension between continuity and similarity on the one hand and these big differences um, on the other. So uh, yeah, I, I, I suppose it's the differences which hit you most um, when you sort of go into the past. And the more you get to know it, the more you discover the similarities. Um, oh, hey, so Moss. Hi. <laughs> I wanted to ask Professor Ling a question, like uh, his opinion, actually, on something, if that's okay, after listening to yeah, all sure. of this. Um, I wanted to ask you, j just your opinion, obviously. Um, do you think that us as people, um, having lost <laughs> A, so much of this in our way of living how much do you believe that has contributed to the onslaught of so much mental illness and depression and in, in mm. our society um like a lot a lot of us with not having community not having a place you know so much of us are uh so many of us are um so obsessed with this idea of freedom and not needing to be anything for anybody else but you think about how humans always were, it, it's it's just how we existed, um, the way of life, spirituality, religion, so many things that today, when you hyper focus on them, you're now different. And it's not it's not the majority anymore. It's not how humans are. Um, so I just wanted to ask your opinion on how you believe That's it's contributed. That's a lovely question. Yeah. That's a really good question. Thank you. And it set me thinking because I think we tend to have a um, we, something we were talking about earlier, a very idealized image of the pre-industrial past. And part of that, I think, is that we tend to assume that pe that people were happier then because their rhythm of life was was more natural. Um, I think the stresses were different. Um, one of my old university lecturers actually wrote a, uh, I think, two volume book on suicide in the Middle Ages. And I remember him telling me that um, when he was researching it in, in archives in Paris, he uh, one, one evening he had to sort of look, seek out a, a, a priest to, to go and talk to, simply because the material he was getting him down. It was so very relentlessly um, depressing and, and he, he you know, felt the same sort of need for uh, some sort of support. And um, I think that's quite a useful corrective because the pressures that produce our current mental illness um, crisis, uh, and I think it, it, that, that probably is the right word. Absolutely. I think we have two things. One is we are much better than we used to be, even within my lifetime, about talking about it openly without fear of judgment. And that's key, I think. Um, it may not be, we may not be all the way there, but we're a lot better than we used to be. And that means that, of course, because we're talking about it a lot more, you can get the impression, if you're not careful, that there's more um, um, you know, there's more mental illness than, than there used to be. I don't think it's that exactly. I think we have created different pressures and the pressures we've created are ones about um, the pressures on ourselves. This idea that you can, yeah, not only that you can be yourself and therefore if you're not, or if you don't, every time people say you can be whatever you want to be, I want to scream because it's not true. Um, you can't always be what you want to be, um, particularly if you're, what you want to be is unrealistic. But by setting that up, you set yourself up to fail. And I think that has a huge impact on people's um, self-esteem and their mental um, health. Um, similarly, um, you know, if you, it's the breakdown of some of the sources of support, some of the networks of support that it's true that previous um, generations did have. Um, the extended family is, is the most obvious one, I suppose. Uh, the way in which um, so many people in of, a, of the sort of, once you get into the, the higher education level, the chances are you'll move away from home for work. So you cut yourself off from the sort of family base that previous generations would have, would have had to fall back on. Um, so I think all of these things create an un unusually intense pressures upon us. The expectations, the expectations of other people of us, the expectations we set ourselves, the expectations we set ourselves because other people expect us to, coupled with the breakdown or the removal of some of the support networks. And, and in this country, it may, I don't know for the States as much, but certainly the sort of church um, background that previous generations again had as a communal support network. I think that makes it a lot harder but, uh, and this is the point I really want to make, 
don't get the idea that everything was rosy um, before because the pressures were different, um, but the impact could be just could be just as devastating. And yes, you do have plenty of people who have what we would recognize as mental health crises um, in earlier ages, but they didn't have the same sort of understanding of them that we've had in the 20th century. This is where we're better off than, than they were. Um, and of course they would um, understand it in terms of the work of the devil. They would think they had in some way been inhabited by an evil spirit or been entra entrapped or whatever. So, that, which of course would make it worse. So it's a, um, in, in general terms, and I don't know if I, I, this may not be a very optimistic answer to, to the question. Um, I think we are facing uh, more intense pressures now, which does create a crisis, but it's not entirely new. And uh, to some extent, we've always had them, but we don't have the same support networks as a safeguard that um, that previous generations had. On the other hand, we have a better psychological understanding. Um, yeah, there you are. <laughs> you can take that answer uh, from just about every angle. <laughs> I mean, and that psychology was also uh, integral to the different um, ways in which uh, medical science was codified and the different different cultures have a different understanding of the psyche. I mean, the modern psychology or psychiatry in a lot of ways was a product of a lot of um, a lot of like Anglo uh, understandings of the world, but also like the Royal Society and so forth. And a lot of uh, well, I mean the French too and the the Germanics. I mean Sigmund Freud, but um, really there there's sort of uh, the, a lot of modern understanding of psy psychiatry as such. Uh, is in another way like codified and follows the history of science uh, that was developed through the British and the Germanics and so forth. So, mm. some of it is coming, of course, from work in Vienna, thinking you know mm -hmm. of um, mm -hmm. Freud and Jung. But of course, a lot of it also from the First World War. And yeah, that's right. The, yeah. Uh, the sort of shell shock work and the understanding that this is not cowardice, which is what you know. Um, post-traumatic stress disorder would, yeah. was written off as before so in some ways we have a better understanding but we don't translate the better understanding necessarily not so much into better care but, but rather better safeguarding we we may have better understanding of mental pressures but it doesn't stop us subjecting ourselves and subjecting those around us to intense mental pressures um almost as if i don't know it's, it's, it's almost as if we think well um we can pick you up again so it doesn't matter if you fall it does yeah. matter if you fall uh, and we don't want people to fall and we we don't have as many safety nets as i think earlier ages did have it's uh, interesting you say safety nets because in a way they didn't have safety nets from certain conditions that are treatable today they didn't have safety nets from uh, uh death during childbirth things of that nature yeah. yet they did have a psychological safety net so it's always interesting to think about uh how can we reintegrate that kind of safety net today when everybody is so atomized so within their different internet bubbles and those bubbles are probably causing themselves to stress out i remember um Let's see, who was, uh, who was talking about this? We had a very interesting conversation talking about uh, VR chat and uh, how when you go into VR chat and you put on the... Uh... Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, Remus. So, yeah, yeah, so you, you I were... I love VR in... chat. Yes, Remus. <laughs> so you were in VR chat and you were as uh, Nechmal, uh, you know, the little... Yeah, I was a, I was a little ferret. Yes. Um, so I'm very, I'm very small. I'm like, I'm like maybe half a foot tall right and and so as a result people are just really forthcoming with information and they just tell you stuff they're very nice to you um but it literally how you appear is however you want so that it, it, even though people know that it doesn't matter they just like treat you differently depending on how you look like instantaneously and they're very um it, they're willing to for some reason people are more willing to listen to like little cute things than they are to anything else like if a little cute thing is giving advice to people they listen to it they sit there and they actually consider it they start and it's funny because you're in vr but you can still see people's like body language right you see their you see them actually like they're, them holding their chins they're actually considering 
what the person is saying. They're they're having a genuine, real conversation. And I thought it was so cool that like it can be the the gap can be bridged, even though you're literally in a in a fake environment. Like it's it, it's it's not tr- almost everything that's happening is not true, but the interaction is as is as genuine as it can be because there's no hang ups about anything. Like there's no you're you're talking only to a voice and a personality rather than all of the other things that come with the person. So people are much more willing to be honest and um, forthcoming with information and just like genuinely talk about the things that are bothering them. It, it's, it's very interesting to see. It's also like weird watching the, um, the generational gap uh, be actively like, like the, it's funny watching adults interact with modern teenagers, like the, because there's no physical interaction. There's no, there's none of the weird, like, this is almost like a, a very American thing and maybe this is spreading, but like here when adults are with anyone that looks like a child or a teenager, people are just automatically suspicious of them. And like, there's a weird um, uh, inherent, like uh, strange sort of, unless they're, unless they're clearly related, there's like a, there's like a weird, like people are, are watching you super hardcore, especially if you're male. Right. In these types of situations, you're talking to literal, like, I'm talking, like, 13, 12, 13 year olds. And I'm, you know, I'm an adult. And these kids are talking to me like I'm I'm a peer, right? So they, they don't have any of the, like, none of the social mores are there. So they can just be honest and be themselves and be as annoying or not annoying as they want to be. And that, that it brings about some very fun and, and interesting interactions. Because you have, like, little kids giving adults advice mm-hmm. and, like, vice versa and 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 actually talking to each other in a way that is um uh, considered and 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 kind and nice there's a lot of not that um because you can but uh i just found it funny um that you can you can do this and especially with other cultures i'm talking to a chinese guy that barely spoke english um but he was just like very like super into wanting to speak english and like learn from english speakers uh, same thing you know what i mean all of the all of the social stuff is gone so you can just be yourself be normal even though you're, you know, you're a ferret going back yeah. to most point um about about mental health there's one very intriguing difference between um the sort of older way in which a community would act as your sort of safety net and the way the net <laughs> the, the web acts as a sort of safety net nowadays and that is anonymity that in a, in a community, of course, everyone knows you and you know them. Now that can, of course, produce its own pressures because there are times when you don't want people who know you to be the people who are listening to you and you, know, you can't open up to them uh, on, you know, in whichever form, in, in social media or, or wherever. Um, um, of course, you've got the issue of anonymity. Now that can be a great thing. Um, and it's, I mean, it's, for example, it's the way in which, you know, support lines and helplines will, will often work. It's anonymous. You can say what you like. It's a safe space. That's good. But the other side, of course, is that you can attack um, from behind an anonymous um, front. And I saw a very, very clear example of this just recently on, on a, it was a Facebook group for people who all grew up in the same uh, town. It's the place where I grew up in. Okay. A lady I'd, I'd never met before, I don't know her at all, she went public with a very, very personal account of the pressures, the mental pressures that she was under. And, uh, you know, I didn't know her, most of us, I don't I suppose, knew her. And various of us, me included, gave her very supportive um, comments to say, look, we don't know each other, but, you know, we, we rallied around her as human, you know, fellow human beings. But, and this is the bit, others didn't. Others sort of attacked her. Why are you going, you know, why are you bearing your soul like this? Do we want to hear all this and so on? And the poor lady sort of ended up, she took down her post and I think it probably did her more harm than good in the end. And I thought that shows the two sides of this, the potential for good, the potential for, um, in this case, it was, you know, absolutely classic Facebook, um, but to act in that role uh, of the community that, you know, had existed in in the old days as sort of uh, a, a new version of that. But on the other hand, the, the less good, you know, not just less good, but the really bad side was that uh, for whatever reason, and God knows why, others wanted to use it in order to pull her down. And uh, and I got the distinct impression she was a lot worse. She was in a far worse state by the end of it than she had been uh, even at the beginning. Moral of the story, don't use Facebook. 
Didn't oh. Indeed, yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Facebook sucks. But don't use Twitter either. It's just as bad. Well, let's not <laughs> jump to conclusions. Oh, uh, excuse me. Yeah, no, we're the actual... Twitter the is real we're patrician. Yeah. Uh, Instagram's yeah, we, a black yeah. hole. Facebook's a black hole. But I, I like yeah, how uh, uh, Buff... I like how Buff wrote, why did you attack that poor lady? Ooh. I don't even know what he's talking about. <laughs> I legit, I'm, I don't know. <laughs> what what the... We yeah, just all know you... it had to be you. Yes. How could you say something to somebody? I mean, I've been quiet all spirited. fucking stream. I don't seem to be anything again. So now <laughs> I'm you too busy it. berating that woman on Facebook. That's what yeah. you were doing. Well, does he have a reputation? <laughs> yeah, he, oh, well, yes, big reputation. So, Ewan, one of the first things that he did on our stream oh, was God. that he put his uh, uh, webcam into a blender and he blended it. Uh, and uh, well, we lost well, signal, you obviously. Because is a performance artist. He, uh, I don't know what the fuck He does is, these, yeah. like, weird Joseph Byers type of uh, performances on stream. Wait, so. Ewan, uh, can you post that photo mm -hmm. where you blew yourself? <laughs> where I blew myself. Where he uh, covered himself in blue no. like an <laughs> ancient Gaelic warrior. Uh, and I'm yeah. Yeah. with yeah, a beat, with a, like a... He's one of those blue person guys. Bit of woad. <laughs> blue man. Yeah, yeah blue exactly. Yeah. A little bit like woad. Woad pills. Exactly. And, uh, he had a blue and then house, he didn't a blue wife, a car that was blue. Yes. I, I always thought that that song I was, no blue GF. I'm blue, I believe I will die, or I'm blue, I'm a mosquito guy, or bl I am blue, if I were green, the green, I would, I would die. die. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, look at Charles Kahn. I mean, look at his face right now. He looks so, yes. he looks miserable. The handsome oh. Ninja Turtle. <laughs> there we go. This is the blue photo uh, right over you here. Win? Yes. Yeah, that is that an I'm going to tell you right now, no, I've I did seen a, red a lot one of on blue screen. jobs before. <laughs> that is an excellent blue job. <laughs> yes, I see the little Here's breathing. Here's something hole. else, man. That's more for my eyes rather than breathing. Oh, yeah. I think <laughs> my one eye. Yeah. yeah, you don't. You don't need to breathe. You have, well, a, you have a different well, I can way breathe anyway. I'm superhuman. But... Yes. So anyway, the uh, the last thing that I wanted to get to oh, is. I want to have a question. Hold on. Have I been oh, quite okay, 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 okay. Well, question, We, we kind of need a bit of a break though before the next. Year. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just want. Um... I want to have at least one question. I've been quiet this entire time. So yeah. Uh, just Sean, how do you? I don't know. I had loads of things I could ask, but the one that came to mind is like, how do you deal with like being the feeling of being small? Because it's just kind of like in terms of social media and everything with like the past. I'm sure this is like something you've at least explored a little bit. Where it's just, especially nowadays, where there's so many people, everyone seems to be famous or something. It's, everyone seems to be better than you. You can seem to compare yourself oh, yeah. to other people. It's kind of like learning how to manage that and learning how to be your own person. So I've definitely been struggling with recently. I'm just curious to see what you kind of think about yeah, that. The idea I think that, that that's, that's a really important point. Um, and it's something which, you know, if you're in any in any sort of teaching, whether it's from, I mean, I've taught in schools, I've taught in universities, so I've you know, done both. And, and yeah, it is this question about uh, people's expectations and therefore, yeah, the, 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 the way in which they will fall short of them uh, you know, if, if if they're unrealistic, and you don't, hey, you you don't you don't want to knock anyone's expectations and dreams because uh, you know they uh, may well uh, get them. I think um, it's in terms of you said it. How do you cope with feeling small? Um, there's nothing wrong in being small, of course, but I know what you mean because people feel that there is. My own feeling is that you have to make sure that people's uh, aims are theirs and not someone else's. That's the first thing. And uh, certainly I can remember in the days when I taught, uh, well, you'll know what's in sixth form, but that's the level, level just below university. And um, frequently you had uh, students who had one particular set of things they wanted to do and their parents wanted something else. And they would sort of turn to us and basically looking at us as allies to try to force their offspring into a part, onto a path that they didn't want to go down. We didn't do that. So that's the first thing. It's got to be it's got to be your wishes. But the other thing is, and I sort of think of a, a student uh, I've got at the moment, he his whole life was about going into the military. Absolutely. It was uh, he was a, he's a military um, First World War reconstructor. You know, he sort of uh, does uh, weekends as a, as a British soul, as a British Tommy. One of um, those guys. Yeah, one of them. That's right. <laughs> and his whole life has been has been this. And then um, about a year or so ago, he discovered that for medical reasons, he could not be accepted into the army. Oh. And the his his life, his, his world sort of imploded um, because every plan he had had every I, dream he'd had for his future not just dream, i don't just mean dream in a in an airy fairy way i mean simply in terms of thinking you know more or less what his career plan was going to be and they went 
And it was devastating for him. And he's only, I said it was about a year or so ago, and he's only just now really climbing out of this and um, and feeling his way to, uh, to a new path. And I think one, one of the most important things you have in terms, it says not to feel small, is to be flexible and to be open to um, to new challenges and not to put not to put your soul into a dream because if you then if it then turns out only to be a dream it will hit your soul if if that's where you put it um and i suppose the other example i have which is has a better end well i mean harry's story isn't over yet but um um, when I taught at the sixth form college, there was a, uh, a guy who couldn't help noticing him. He swept the corridors, but he swept them wearing shirt and tie and jacket and looking very smart. Unusual. Okay? And, uh, and he was an unusual man. I got to know him. He had been a student at the college. He wanted to go to university. He couldn't hack it. He, he, he came out there again. His dreams had gone. What he found was a new purpose in life from sweeping the college. Now that might not sound it, but his thinking was, and this is why he dressed in the way that he did, that a clean environment is essential for learning. If you don't see that, you wait until you're working in somewhere which is not clean and, fi- and, and, and then you very quickly discover that actually in his way, he was contributing to, to the learning process just as much as anyone else. And that that deserved uh, he, he, I have to tell you, you know, he didn't stay in shirt and tie for very long, but he did start off in that way. And he was making a statement. And I thought, now there's someone who sort of changed his, or it's not so much that he's changed his dream. He still wanted to contribute to learning, but he found a different way into it. He had he that changed sort of his perception. Exactly. Changed the perception. Mm. He was able to adapt. Outlook. And I think that would be my answer to your question, Ewan, that, that um, it's not being small at all. As if it makes sense to you, it doesn't matter what others people, other people think of it. Um, if it makes sense to you, then it makes sense. But that flexibility, that b- being open, not tying yourself to one particular path, I think is essential. Otherwise, you will end up riding for a fall and for a fail. And, and who wants that? Mm. Exactly. I suppose yeah, what I really it's... struggle with is the kind of lack of purpose and like not understanding what I really want out of like that's the main thing that's something you kind of have to figure out as you go along isn't it you can't just have someone tell you yeah that's because that. otherwise that's the, that's, journey. Um, that's the journey of being alive is figuring exactly. out all right what am i going to do now i've got bad news for you and i haven't found it yet either <laughs> uh, you know alexander alexander <laughs> conquers oh, cool. the world and stands there and goes well now what boys now what yeah exactly. and, and, it's now? A, and it's important that it makes sense to you you and yeah get it exactly yeah, yeah yes yeah. <laughs> i get it yeah so the the uh, the last question that I had, and I really appreciate uh, Sean, uh, Professor Lang. I still don't know what's the better way to call you because last time you said to call me Sean, and so... yeah, it's my it's my name. I'm quite used to it. <laughs> so when it comes to the students uh, of this generation that you are uh, teaching right now, what are certain differences you're noticing in them as opposed to the generation before? And also, has there been, because we already went over academia, has there been any talk even close to what we were talking about, like with the ancient civilizations, like the antediluvian stuff? Has there been talk of that nature among the younger crowd? Or is that not really in the uh, in the ballpark of what they're interested in? Okay, the first difference between um, the students that I see now and even the students I saw when I started my career is unquestionably the impact of social media and of all the all the possibilities um, for research, for reading, and what have you that that the web has brought. They are, it, I mean, they talk about uh, the digital generation or digital um, in people born digital. That's the phrase I think, and it's absolutely right. There's an instinct. Um, I mean, I see it with you lot, with with with, uh, with you guys. Um, and that is totally different, even from people who were sort of students in, I don't know, the 90s. The change about is, is indeed it is around about the millennium, um, I, I think. Yeah. Um, when it becomes it's not use the, the, uh, the web, it's that you're sort of born using the web. Yeah, there's an intuitiveness to it. Exactly. It is intuitive. And uh, and that is the biggest difference. That's the, it's a huge generational difference there. Um, I mean, obviously, it's got its good sides and it's got its bad sides. Um, but overwhelmingly, I think it's, it's a good side. Um, linked to that, I think, is uh, not exactly an ambition because I'm not, you know, all, all generations um, can be ambitious, but a, um, a sort of realistic ambition, if you like, an awareness of what you can achieve, um, which is, I, I think, at a... Uh, you know, they think globally. 
they act globally. Um, the, uh, I mean, a, a, a group like this, again, you know, here we are all talking uh, and we're on at least two different continents. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, we're all, I'm in yeah. West Virginia. Like, I'm far away from you guys as possible. Exactly. <laughs> so keeping that way, I know. Um, but yeah, again, that's a sort of natural thing, um, which is, again, it's an instinct. So though, those, that's, I suppose, the most obvious difference that I've noticed in terms of uh, the students sort of developing over the time. But as for the talking in academia, um, I have to say that uh, I don't pick up that particular area because there's a lot more talk about um, threats to academia, threats to, uh, I suppose, sort of freedom of expression from different quarters. Um, and I suppose above all, there's a, uh, and, and maybe there's a generational thing here with the uh, sort of young generation of academics, uh, an impatience to change academia to um to rethink it to revisit it the sort of thing we were talking about earlier uh, about um recasting the canon um recasting the traditional curricula in the various subjects and this isn't confined to the obvious ones like the arts and the humanities you get you get it in the sciences and you get it in maths as well and yeah, that is saying math is racist now. now sorry they were saying math is racist uh, yeah, just exactly, a couple yeah. weeks ago. Like, like per, ca no, per capita now is racist. Who was, sorry, who was saying math so. is racist? Who was? Was it some random on Twitter? Was it someone uh, that No, ma math professor, math PhDs. Yeah, there well, were articles. Well, now they were like saying per capita, out. this writer for, uh, yeah. was it? Yeah, it was it's it's the New Yorker. People, it's literally yeah, math. Yeah, it was absurd <laughs> trash. Uh, yeah. You're right. You get him out of you. But I feel, I feel like those, like pointing out those ridiculous examples, is sort of like distracting from the real sort of issue of like how academia has become debased by several different factors, not just like, mm -hmm. not just like the woke stuff, but also like the fact that academia has become like, um, I don't know, like sort of a consumerist jobs program yes. for corporations, yes. like yeah. stuff I like that. Say, it's a, it's a market, um, mm -hmm. and students are the consumers. And um, there's mm, much yeah. more um, bending over, particularly since over here, the students have started paying fees uh, in, the, in the last um, 10 years or so. And that's transformed the, 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 the feel of the, of the, uh, of the sector. Um, and uh, even though, I mean, the reality is that I've never known a student sort of go off and say, I'm going to take my custom elsewhere. They might, they might leave a university for other reasons, but it's not normally that. Nevertheless, it's as if that's about to happen. Um, and uh, so it's not exactly accountability in the best way. It's much more a sort of um, fear of the market and market forces. I think that's what I would say. Mm. NFTs. <laughs> I'm assuming it's not the National Film Theatre. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah. I'm off Sneed. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it's a difficult concept to try to wrap my head around. Uh, it's a uh, essentially you're buying buying and selling images, right? Like, I, have I have I got that right? Right. What didn't didn't the didn't like the Turner Prize someone won with a GIF now or was that another art prize? Ooh, I haven't heard that. It wouldn't surprise me. It was something like that. It was like a film that was a GIF. Yeah. So yeah, I know it wouldn't surprise. It was uh, a movie, but it was a GIF. Yes, a GIF I believe so. Well, yeah. there was that one year where they just gave it to all four of the uh, finalists. Yeah, they did, didn't they? Yeah. So uh, yeah. well, I don't know. I personally think it hasn't been. Uh, the Turner Prize hasn't been the same since they gave it to uh, Grace and Barry, but that's just my own person <laughs> uh, thing. So are we wrapping up, Lev, or is that? Uh, it's like, how how late is it in Britain? It's like... 9.30. Oh, okay. Yeah, yep. that's Not awesome. that late. Yeah, this guy is sharp. I like this guy. <laughs> 
History is a very <laughs> fascinating <laughs> subject. Uh, well, that's not quite right. The university students don't, but I can tell you the uh, uh, the eleven year olds year ago, um, many years ago when I was teaching at that level, they did. The eleven year olds. Yep, did. that's us. <laughs> <laughs> Curiosity. Yeah. yeah. They're willing to listen. That's true. They don't know not to ask. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Make it Lev, apparently you're muted oh. on the YouTube end. We can hear you, but apparently, I keep, like, forgetting, I keep forgetting about that. I was muted this whole time. So, guys, for those who do not know what I was saying, what I was asking, I was asking uh, You're just Professor. Posting <laughs> this thing without any context. Uh, oh, yes. What are you? <laughs> okay, are you... I will explain what this is real quickly. So, we're having the NFT stream right after this. So, guys, as soon as this stream shuts down. Go and you'll see it because uh, I put it on YouTube so that it should automatically transfer to the NFT stream. I'm not leaving this Zoom window. It's going to be the same Zoom window, but we're going to have the NFT stream starting up. We're going to have a lot of NFT people there. <laughs> and this thing that I posted, this is on Super Rare right now. You can get it. It just got tokenized right now. So go in there, get it. And uh, I'm going to be setting the price for it around like a thousand thousand bucks. So again, my last thing, it got bought for 2,200 bucks. So this one I'm setting to a thousand bucks. And yes, Sean, people are going to pay money for a digital animated GIF. So there, there I there think I need to get in on that market. Jesus Christ. You're onto a oh. good thing there, Lev. <laughs> one man's trash, another man's treasure. We're, we're right. turning it into good We're turning it into BTRs. So if they say in the yeah. North over here, where there's muck, there's brass. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So with, with that, I just want to say, <laughs> Professor Lang, Sean, it was a great pleasure as always to have you on. Guys, yep. go, go, buy, go buy Professor Lang's book over here, British History for Dummies. I have it right here. It is a beautiful book. It is a great read. Wonderful uh like you turn it into you turn it into a story you turn it into something that is worth reading and sinking your teeth into and i really appreciate that and i'm sure so do all the uh, students that uh, attend your lectures and uh yeah that's pretty much it so sean thank you so much that's grand thank, thank you. you thanks everyone it's great talking thank you, to you. Yes, thank Have a good you very one. much professor Thanks. So again i'm going to be stopping the stream right now and we are going to oh, be by the way uh, yes. send the link to barrett He's, he's oh, asking. So. Sure, 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 sure. I'm going to do that. Texas uh, Ranch. What's his yeah, name? Yeah, so, so we are going to be transitioning. I mean, honestly, I don't yeah. even want to be transitioning. Well, I'm, I, uh, I'm, I'm just, just going to be in the same this whole time. Moss, yes. Moss is sleeping. Here, oh, here, okay, here's, so. here's what I'm going to do. I have a problem. full gender fluid. <laughs> I have a proposition. I have a proposition for you guys. Whoever wants to stick around for the <sighs> NFT stream, yeah. please feel free to stick around. I but will. But is can I use this same link? So I want to work on. Uh, yes, yes, Stevens yes. This is the game. same. I have a new so... woodblock I'll reveal as the NFT yeah. stream. Maybe I can oh, sell nice. these NFTs. I'm gonna go work on the yeah, Michael Stevens game. That, that yeah, woodblock. Yeah, sure. That woodblock is okay. But what I'm gonna do? Yeah, is... You're gonna love this one too. It's gonna be amazing, uh, Remus. It's gonna. I'm very excited. Gonna read. Hmm. But what I'm gonna do right now is I'm going to shut the camera off. I feel that uh, I should probably. Are we keeping the same link? No, we we have a different link, but we are keeping the same. Zoom screen. Can you so send me that link? Is this that okay? is the link. This is the link. You're, okay. you're oh, 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 you mean YouTube. You mean YouTube. I, uh, no, no, no. Oh, oh, so different YouTube link, same Zoom link. Oh, they yeah. His, his love pumps it through okay. OBS and that like Zoom is going through his OBS then. Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, I got like, it. I got it. Yeah. Stream, what do they call it? Stream yeah. Labs or whatever. No, we're, we're not on the stream anymore. The stream's off. Yeah. No, 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 no. The stream is still on. We are still streaming. Oh, we yes. are still streaming right no, now. No, no. Why don't we have a different stream? 
Uh, I'm going to transition into the different stream right now. This is the first oh, time I have okay. ever I have wow. ever done it. We have 25 people watching right now. So again, for those who did not subscribe, be sure to subscribe. But also, I want to figure out what the best way of doing this is. Because I want to basically take all of you guys and just throw you push into you the other stream. There. Yes. <laughs> just push Rose you over to the there. Wall. Push, push me over there. the edge. Yes. But throw me the in the trash. But at I'll the same time, every stream. but at the same time, we still have to get the people of the NFT stream to come up there. And it would be kind of weird for this discussion to happen at 540 instead of six o'clock. So there would be a pause. Yeah. I mean, this would be a time for yeah. us to recuperate. 20 minutes of recuperation time so again whoever wants to stick around with this zoom link that is fine i am ending the stream once again big appreciation to sean uh professor lang for being here i'm gonna end the stream right now guys and i wait will patiently see yes. we have to go and walk a little bit yes exactly yes there we go okay so guys i will see you in a bit once again that stream oh in fact you know what let me put the link of that stream in the chat as well even though it should show up anyway and uh that is nft mayhem that is what's crackalacking so i'm posting it right now here in the btr chat see if they, the see speaking of mayhem if uh if dead killed himself um like back like nowadays and like you know, uh, Euronymous took a picture of it, and like It'd he could so have sold fun. the instead of like the bootleg. Dude, it would make so much money, dude. Oh instead of the bootleg for uh, Donna Blackhearts, it would be Donna the Blackhearts. It would be an NFT with a oh picture of dead. God. There you go. <laughs> So guys, we have only we have only two people waiting in the NFT mayhem. That is no good. All of you right now who are watching this, all twenty five of you, what are you doing? Go, yeah. go there, go there right now. Go I have right the link now. in the chat. Tell, tell everyone right now. that's part of it to well, retweet we will the stream. So. Beat you yes, to death in Minecraft. Yes, exactly, guys. Retweet the stream if you are part of it. Go to the stream oh, right yeah. now. Okay, four waiting. That's better, but that's still not enough. So all of you, go there. You're gonna see uh, it as soon as we end the stream. Once again, I appreciate you. Mwah. Take care. Bye-bye.